We have everyone in attendance except Levi, so I'll note when he walks in. Um, welcome to the Salt Lake City Planning Commission hybrid meeting for June 22nd. Um, this is our first hybrid meeting, so I hope everybody can give us some patience as we work through whatever glitches may happen. But we are going to um, open this meeting with the approval for the minutes. The agenda says for June 8, but we actually need a motion for the approval of May 25th uh, minutes. I didn't see the June in the Dropbox. We just have May 25th. Madam Chair, I move that we approve the minutes of um, May 25th. Thank you. Thank you. I'll second. Okay, thank you. Everybody race to that. I have a motion from Brenda and a second from Maureen. Let's go ahead and take a um, vote. Amy? Okay, I'll come back to you. Adrian? Yes. John? Yes. Andreas? I will um, excuse myself due to illness last time. Okay, abstain. Thank you. Rick? Yes. Brenda? Abstention. And reason? I was not there. Thank you. And the, the rules I just learned say that we have to give a reason when we abstain. So, um, Mike? Yes. Maureen? Yes. And Amy? There, there was a new, there was a version put in there for May 25th. All right, David, you'll note that. Okay. Okay, it'll be changed. And I vote yes, and I have no Levi. So, okay, that motion passes. Thank you all. And I wanted to make one announcement for everyone tonight because this is a hybrid meeting there's a whole bunch of people participating via webex and the only way they can hear is if people who are speaking have to be speaking into the microphone um, so just keep that in mind otherwise um, those those folks participating that way won't be able to hear what we're saying Okay, let's move on to the next part, which is um, a report from the chair and the vice chair. I don't have anything to report. I have nothing. Okay, and a report from the director, Amy, John? Um, yeah, the only thing Nick wanted us to bring up is the, just that the council adopted as a part of a budget a new planner, but it would be focused on land use applications that are related to inland port jurisdictional lands only. So I think it's funded in September, so we won't hear anything for a little while. But Okay. And I was also going to say, just as a reminder, too, to make sure we speak to the microphone, because also the overflow room, the audio is not as good as it is in here, and in here is not that great either. So just a reminder. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Okay, this is the part, um, our new part of the agenda for our planning commission discussion. If you have questions for um, staff or if you want to bring up any discussion items. None? Okay, we'll move on. All right, I'm going to open up the public hearing portion of the meeting, but before I do that, I'm gonna just kind of, sorry, go over uh, just some, like the lay of the land, I guess. What? A what report? Yeah, but before we do that. Okay, th thanks, Brenda. So, I just want to, I know that most of you are participating in a planning commission for the first time. We do have a full room here. We also have an overflow room across the hall and um, however many people are participating on WebEx. So I want to just go over the, the rules of decorum that we have um, at the planning commission. And um, that is, we value all input and all 
points of view. So we do not allow clapping or booing or jeering or anything of that nature um, because we want to make sure everybody feels um, that their voice is heard and they're not intimidated. The second item I want to just clarify for everybody tonight, including commissioners, that we have two items before us, but they are legislative items. So we do not make the decision on this particular um, item tonight. We are making a recommendation to the city council. It'll be a positive or a negative recommendation, and then it'll move on to them as they are the ultimate deciding governing body for this. If you wish to comment tonight, we have cards out in the hallway and I will need you to fill them out. Um, and we have staff out there to collect them, so make sure you um, give them to Aubrey or Nick outside. You can select on there if you wish to speak or you don't wish to speak, but you want your, your comments or um, your position stated into the record. But in order to make this meeting go well, please fill out cards if you're in person here. Once we get to the WebEx, we'll get extra instructions, but um, at the bottom of your screen, the bottom right, there is a hand um, that you will need to click to raise your hand to speak when we get to that point. And then we'll be accepting emails that are sent to planning.comments at slcgov.com um, if they are not via someone who's already spoken. Um, so the process tonight is going to be, we start with the staff report. Um, and then we will have the applicant come up and give a presentation. The appli applicant can take up to 10 minutes. At that time, the Planning Commission may have questions for them. Um, but then I'll open it up for the public comment portion. We have two recognized community organizations. They will speak first. They get um, up to five minutes, and then everyone else we will call, and we'll give more instructions for that. Um, the general public gets two minutes each, and I will be enforcing that tonight because we have so many people who want to speak and we want to keep the meeting moving forward. So don't take it personally, but um, I will to let you know when your two minutes are up. All right, that's all I'm going to go in now. So Daniel, let me get the cheat sheet. Hold on. All right, so we now have the Capitol Park Cottages zoning map and master plan amendments at approximately 675 North F Street. This is case number PLN PCM 2020-00335 um, and case number PLN PCM 2020-00334. Thank you. <clears throat> so again, this is a zoning map and master plan amendment request for property at 675 North F Street uh, by the property owner Ivory Development. Uh, the first request is to amend the zoning map of the property from the FR3 Foothills Residential District to the SR1 Special Development Pattern District. The second part of the request is to amend the master plan, which is the Avenues Master Plan, from the very low density designation to a low density designation. And the intent of these rezone and master plan amendment requests is to accommodate a 19 lot single family development, uh, which they have submitted as formal plan development and preliminary subdivision plans. Those are not before the commission tonight, but they may come to the commission at a later point. And just up front, staff is recommending a favorable, condition, favorable recommendation to the city council with some conditions. So for some context, this is an aerial of the subject property located at the top of F Street at about 13th Avenue. The property is 3.2 acres in size. Uh, for size comparison, a typical avenues block on, shown on the right is 2.5 acres in size. <clears throat> to the north of the site is a 49 unit townhome development called North Point Estates Condominiums. Uh, to the west is the Capital Park subdivision, which primarily consists of single family detached. And then the Meridian Condos is located to the south of the site and that is currently has 27 units uh, and it's a multifamily uh, property. And then at the south uh, east, you also have a single family uh, detached block. So it's also important to note that Capital Park Avenue is not a public street, it is a private street. So for zoning context, this is a zoning map of the surrounding area. So the property is surrounded by FR3 to the north and west, and then SR1A 
the SR1 sister zone uh, to the east. And on the south, the property is owned RMF 35, uh, but there's a note there, it is restricted to a low density uh, development potential rather than the full RMF uh, 35 development potential because of a development agreement uh, when it was rezoned that the city entered into to restrict the number of units on the property. Another note here is that this zoning map also asks, acts as the Avenues Master Plan Future Land Use Map. Uh, so, it so the zoning actually is specifying the future land uses of the property. So the quirk there is because the city zoned uh, the city with new zoning designations in 1995 and at the same time replaced all prior master plan future land use maps with the zoning map. So uh, in the avenues where the master plan is from 1987, the zoning acts as the uh, future land use map. And because of that, the FR3 is a, a very low density designation, and the SR1A is a low density designation, and similarly, the RMF35 that was restricted to the number of units uh, is also a low density designation. So it's important to understand what the requested zone would mean for the property. Uh, each zone has a lot size regulation that uh, controls the amount of dwellings that can be built on the property. So the FR3 has a 12,000 square foot minimum lot size requirement, and the SR1 has a 5,000 square foot lot requirement. So what that ends up being is 3.6 dwelling units per acre for the FR3 zone, and 8.7 uh, dwelling units per acre for the SR1 zone. Assuming that each property is developed with uh, attached, or accessory dwelling units, uh, those numbers are doubled to 7.3 for FR3 and 17.6 uh, for the SR1. So theoretically, with the FR3 zone, you could have on the subject site 11 lots based purely on the size uh, requirements of the zone. And similarly, for the SR1, you could theoretically have 27 lots on the subject property. But uh, that doesn't account for lot width, public street requirements, and in this case, a limitation on the number of access points onto the private drive, uh, Capitol Park Avenue. So realistically, uh, staff believes that the FR3 has a nine lot potential, and the SR1 would have an 18 lot potential. And again, doubling that, uh, you end up with 18 total dwelling units under FR3, and uh, 36 dwelling units under SR1. If they wanted to, if they wanted to go uh, beyond that, uh, they could ask for discretionary modifications to lot design requirements, so that you could modify the lot width requirements or uh, have a private street rather than a public street, uh, to and, and essentially you could have more lots uh, through that process. But that would be coming to the planning commission for discretionary approval. So similarly, uh, the applicant's concept plans are 19 lots, so close to the practical limitation of the zone without any special processes. Uh, and they're proposing additionally ADUs on 14 of the lots for 33 total dwelling units. So the major differences between the zones, again, were the lot size and density. Uh, also, you have differences, particularly in the rear yard setbacks. The FR3 has a minimum flat 35 minimum uh, uh, setback, whereas the SR1 has a variable setback of 25% with a minimum of 15 uh, and a maximum of 30. So you could essentially have uh, buildings next to a property line within 15 feet. Uh, additionally, the FR3 also does not allow buildings uh, like garages in the rear yard. Beyond that, the heights are the same. They're both at 28 feet. Uh, building coverages are similar with 5% difference. Uh, the uh, FR3 has a maximum building coverage of 35%, and the SR1 has a coverage limit of 40%. Front setbacks are the same, both at 20. Side setbacks, there's about a six, there is a six foot difference. ADUs, attached ADUs are allowed by right in both zones if they are internal to the structure. If they are an external structure, uh, it is conditional in the FR3, uh, but permitted in the SR1. And as far as parking, normal parking requirements apply to both of these zones, two stalls per home plus one per accessory dwelling unit. Daniel, 
I'm sorry, but can you clarify? It looked like it's a six inch difference, not a six foot difference on the side. The side. Setbacks. Is that right? It is a, a six foot difference. So the FR3 has 10 feet on one side, 10 feet on the other, and the SR1 has 10 feet on one side and four feet on the other. So as far as considerations uh, for standards of review for rezones and master plan amendments, uh, the key considerations are consistency with adopted city plans and policies, consistency with zoning ordinance purposes, uh, f potential effects of the zone on adjacent properties, uh, consistency with any applicable overlays, such as a historic overlay, and the adequacy of public facilities and services that could be libraries, schools, or utility lines. But just to note, ultimately, this is a discretionary decision by the city council, uh, and they don't necessarily have to uh, take into consideration these standards. So based on these considerations, staff has identified some key considerations for the proposal. Uh, the first of these has to do with the potential impacts on adjacent properties. So again, there's that FR3 rear yard difference uh, with 35 feet required for FR3 and the more variable requirement for SR1. So essentially, you could have buildings up to the rear property line on the west uh, that are within 15 feet of the property line. So that could potentially impact the privacy of rear yards, the sense of openness, uh, because of that was potential impact, staff is recommending a condition on the rezone uh, that second stories have a minimum setback of 30 feet, so that additional height is stepped away from the property line. Additionally, again, because the FR3 doesn't allow structures in rear yards, uh, we are recommending that the west rear yards next to the FR3 zone uh, also could not have accessory buildings uh, to avoid any potential incompatibility impacts. So traffic impacts come up with any zone, any rezone with additional units. Uh, the question is how much traffic uh, would, would come with this rezone. Uh, the applicant did provide a traffic study showing a low impact to the neighborhood. Uh, it would account for about 5% of traffic at two nearby F Street intersections uh, that follow from the property uh, traveling downtown. Uh, but those do add less than a second to wait times at the intersections, according to the traffic study. Accidents, uh, there were concerns with, for any additional accidents with additional traffic. Uh, their staff pulled available traffic or accident information over the past 10 years. Uh, there's been a very low number of serious accidents on or near F Street over that time. And given the relatively low increase in traffic based on the traffic study, staff would not anticipate any substantive impacts uh, from that additional traffic on an accident rate. So it's also important to consider uh, where the SR1 zone is mapped. Uh, this map shows the zoning for the entire lower avenues. As shown before, the SR1A, not the proposed SR1, is mapped across most of the lower avenues area. Uh, this SR1A zone is the proposed zone sister zone. It's identical except for a maximum height limit. So the SR1A has a 23 foot height limit versus a 28 foot limit for the SR1. Uh, and just to note, that was incorrectly stated in the staff report. Uh, the density lot requirements are the same. Uh, but for context here, you do have SR1A across from the street from FR3 properties along 11th, 12th, and 13th Avenue. So I think it's also helpful to understand what this level of density looks like in the avenues. So the map on the right shows the existing density of lower, lower avenues block by block. Uh, the subject property is shown with the proposed density just for comparison purposes. Uh, the developer's plans have a density of about 10 dwelling units per acre. Uh, this, again, is just shy of the practical maximum of 11, 11 units per acre. Uh, so on the map, you can see a lot of the blocks along 12th and 13th Avenue have densities around 6 or 7. If half the homes on those blocks included ADUs, they would have about the same density as the proposed development. So as you get a few streets lower, there are a lot of blocks that currently have the same density as the proposal. Uh, there are blocks with a mix of single and two-family homes. Uh, I've included some examples here. Uh, the first example is at F Street and 10th, uh, 10th Avenue. So you have, in this case, 
townhomes on the left side of the image, and you have single-family detached homes on the right. The second example is on F Street and 9th Avenue, where you have on this block a mix of single-family and two-family uh, buildings. And then on the third example, you have D Street and 9th Avenue. You have duplexes designed to look like single-family homes. So there are a number of examples of low-scale, single- and two-family dwellings on nearby blocks with a similar existing density. And those compatibly exist with the surrounding properties. So master plans are one of the most important considerations for staff in evaluating amendments. In this case, the property is in the Avenues Master Plan, which specifically identifies the property, again, as very low density. Uh, it also has policies that support larger lots in the foothills area, and those policies are related to environmental, aesthetic, and traffic concerns. But it does identify the subject property as the text as a low density property. Uh, this was the former BYU uh, campus site in the avenues, and it has a number of policies that speak to uh, low density uses on the site. But having said that, overall, the avenues master plan generally supports maintaining the existing zoning in the avenues. However, we also need to look at other more recent city plans uh, that apply citywide. So these include the housing plan, uh, Growing Salt Lake City. Uh, these, this plan includes policies intended to ensure low and moderate income housing is in the city. It also supports aging in place uh, with diverse housing choices, so ADUs, uh, smaller uh, dwelling units to support someone moving out of their larger home to a smaller home and remaining in their neighborhood. It also identifies large lot sizes over 10,000 square feet as a barrier uh, to meeting our, our housing needs. Additionally, uh, there are a number of different general policies in Plan Salt Lake. Uh, it supports finding ways to accommodate new housing growth and new housing types where it can be compatible throughout the city. And just to note, the housing market has clearly changed significantly uh, since the original Avenues Master Plan was adopted. Citywide plans about housing in our general plan have, have uh, made note of this and included these new policies to help address uh, those housing needs. Uh, given this, staff believes amendments are warranted given the low level of zoning change, uh, the change conditions for housing, and change citywide policies. Another common concern we get with vacant uh, or with rezones in general are concerns with displacement, gentrification, loss of neighborhood character defining buildings. Uh, we're generally getting rezone requests for properties with or redevelopment requests with, for properties with existing housing units on them. This is unique that it's a vacant lot. Uh, it doesn't have those same potentials. Uh, additionally, this is in a high opportunity area in the city with good access to jobs, schools, parks, and services and generally a good location for additional families. So uh, the applicant has submitted formal plan development and subdivision plans. Uh, again, they're not for formal consideration tonight, uh, but they have been provided in the staff report and here to provide some context. Uh, th there are some building height compliance issues due to the slope of the property uh, with their proposed elevations, so that may require changes to their proposed plans. Uh, and just to note, height can't be modified with a plan development, so uh, they, need, they would need to make changes before bringing those plans to the commission for consideration. And uh, I'm not gonna go into every single request in these plans, but they are requesting modifications to setbacks, lot frontage, uh, because 14 of the lots have frontage only on a private street. Uh, they're also asking for changes to uh, our grade change limitations and our retaining, hall, retaining wall height limits. So we have received a considerable amount of public input on this proposal. Uh, the proposal has changed over time with multiple rounds of public comments and noticing. Originally, the developer was proposing FBUN1, uh, but that, and so there was initial round of noticing with that. Uh, then they made some changes to the concept plans and also made change to the zoning request to SR1, so there were additional rounds of public comments then. And then when formal plan development plans were submitted, there was also another noticing round where additional public comments were provided. 
So all that together, the vast majority of public comments were against the proposal or opposed to the proposal at 637 comments about uh, with less than 20 comments in support of the proposal. Uh, there was also a petition circulated uh, with an estimated 2,000 signatures uh, that uh, signed opposed to the proposal as well. As far as input from recognized community organizations, uh, the Greater Avenues Community Council did provide multiple letters opposed to the rezone request. Uh, the Preserve Our Avenue Zoning Coalition also provided opposition letters and petitions. Uh, generally, there are a variety of concerns related to the increased density of the zone, uh, but they do support development with the existing FR3 zoning. And as far as zoning specific comments from adjacent properties, uh, on the west, uh, one of the property owners submitted uh, comments opposed to the rezone request, uh, particularly because they would like a 35 foot uh, rear setback next to their property. Uh, east property owners also submitted comments. Uh, two owners submitted comments with concerns about density, traffic, and vehicle access. Uh, again, opposed to the development. Uh, also, one additional owner provided concerns with the original FBUN1 uh, zoning proposal, but did not subsequently provide any comments on uh, the additional iterations of the proposal. On the south, the Meridian Condos HOA uh, provided multiple letters, including from their residents with concerns with density, vehicles, char character of the neighborhood, use of their private road. I'm sure I'm not capturing all of the comments here, uh, but those were some key ones. Uh, the Capitol Park HOA also had similar concerns. And to the north, the North Point Condo HOA and residents had similar concerns, but also had concerns with the reduced setback on the north of their property. Uh, also concerns with traffic, fire access, and safety, particularly related to any potential evacuation of North Point condos in the event of a wildfire uh, next to their property. And then plan development comments, there were a, a number of different comments, uh, concerns with reduced setbacks, grade changes, open space, uh, vehicles, parking, service logistics, uh, and loss of trees. So with that, uh, staff is recommending a positive recommendation to the City Council on the zoning map and master plan amendment requests with the uh, conditions related to the rear yard uh, setback and also uh, accessory buildings in the rear yards. Uh, staff believes the quest is relatively a low density, low scale zone that can be compatible with the adjacent low density development. And staff believes it's warranted given changes to general city policies and long term changes to the housing market despite not generally aligning with the original Avenue's master plan. And with that, I can take any questions. All right, thanks, Daniel. I have one clarification on your condition. So on the west side um, setback issue, that proposed house, which would be in the northwest corner, that would be like their side yard. It right? would be. So if we, you know, I feel like that condition language should just be saying anything along that west property line? It, as worded, it would only apply if there was an actual rear yard uh, next to a property line, next yeah, to that so property like line. Then the reduced setback for a side yard would be 10 feet. That's correct. If and there so was a side if, yard there. if we're being consistent in that northwest corner, it should be 25 feet continuously. You, yeah, the, the condition could be worded that way. That's one thing I just... That was inconsistent. If we if we call out it being rear yard, that one house would escape that wording. That is true. And so, yep. if we are trying to buffer that, I think we, commission can think about that. All right, and commissioners, any questions for staff at this time? Yeah, I have a question. Um, <clears throat> there's considerable angst about the actual plan development proposal. Um, but that's not what we're reviewing tonight, correct? That's correct. And in the, um, so if the zoning, for example, tonight is approved at SR3, that does not mean that the plan development itself would also be approved as it is not currently being proposed. Is that correct? That's also correct. So yes. there are many changes in that plan development that require conditional uses, and that is something that's still at the discretion. Uh, of the Planning Commission based on the criteria we use for plan development approvals, correct? That's correct, yes. The, yep. Any other questions? 
Okay, thanks, Daniel. Um, what? Levi, did you did you have a question? Oh, I thought he shook his head. No. No, I thought you said. Ah, oh, yes, thank you. Um, for the record, I want to mark that Levi did come in be prior to the staff report. Thank you. I knew I told you to remind me for a reason. <laughs> that was it. Okay, we'll go ahead and um, bring up the applicant. Um, I'm just going to say Peter and Chris, and then you can say your last names for me into the microphone. Um, I also have a third applicant, Nick Mingo. Is he also here? Okay. If I don't know if you wanted to come up and, and also present at the table, but you're fine if you don't want to. Okay. Madam Chair, the applicants did give some literature they wanted to share with the commission, if you're okay with passing these around. Sure. Okay. And um, once you state your name for the record, then you'll have up to 10 minutes. My name is Peter Gamvrulis. I'm joined here with Chris Gamvrulis, the president of Ivory Development. Uh, I appreciate the Planning Commission having us tonight and reserving the agenda items for us. Um, I also want to thank planning staff. We've had the opportunity to speak w and work with several of them on. You might have to speak closer to your microphone. Just I always say to the point you're uncomfortable is where you need to be so that everyone can hear you. I'm certainly un perfect. uncomfortable now. There you are. Thank then it's you. perfect. Thanks. Um, so I do want to thank the planning staff. We've had the opportunity to work with several of them, um, especially Daniel. He's been instrumental in this and has spent countless hours uh, working and guiding us through this process. So. I just want to thank you, Daniel. I appreciate it a lot. And before I start the presentation, uh, the item that I had passed out to you, um, I just want to not miss the opportunity to share that we were the 2021 Home Builder of the Year um, by Pro Builder Magazine. So this magazine talks about a lot of the initiatives we've done throughout Salt Lake City and the state in general uh, regarding the housing uh, affordability crisis. So if you have an opportunity, leaf through it later tonight. If not, I'm happy to take them and reuse them. So Daniel went over a lot of this, but <clears throat> I just wanted to touch on this slide because our property in the black, uh, which is being considered today for rezone, is next to three different zones and five different housing types. I'll go through quickly, but to our south, we have condominiums, zoned RMF 35. To our west, we have the FR3 zone, uh, which is one of the largest, least intense zones in the avenues and supports third acre and quarter acre lots and largest state homes. To the north, we also have the FR3 zone, however, it's non-conforming, in that instead of having quarter and third acre lots, it has townhomes. To our west, excuse me, to our east, and throughout predominantly the avenues in general, you have the SR1A zone. The SR1A zone is unique in that it supports several types of housing units. Those are single family, two family, and in the case of even a couple of blocks down the street, small, less intense multifamily, like Northcrest and Enzyme Place. With all of this diversity next to us, we got lucky enough to be zoned with the most restrictive zone, which is the FR3. And how did we get here? Well, we got here starting off with the Avenues Master Plan. And the Avenues Master Plan has not been updated since 1987. So at the time in 1987, we were, you can see my scroll, roughly around here, which was considered the foothills. So they were set with a foothill overlay to protect from erosion and flooding and other foothill related and uh, mountainside considerations. And if you look at the pr property at the time of the zone and the time of the master plan, this made sense. The only real construction that was nearby it was the hospital and then the avenues block pattern. It was at the fringes of development. But if you fast forward to today, this is no like longer the site's case. Uh, we are surrounded on all sides by residential development. This is no longer the mountainsides. This is an infill, infill property. But there were other considerations that went into <clears throat> zoning the FR3. And if you look a little deeper into the Avenue's master plan, you can see the types of values and objectives that they held at the time. Uh, for example, they kind of refer to it as a happy accident, but they said that the foothill zones had led to the foothills above the avenues becoming the most exclusive and prestigious lots. They encouraged large lots and large homes, and this was celebrated. Furthermore, there was celebration in regards to the accomplishments were down zoning in general, actually re removing four and five lot apartments, what we might call missing middle today. They were celebrating that those were becoming single family homes and they were celebrating the fact that it was no longer known as a renter community. So what does this zone get you? 
And it's the inevitable case that would come from this type of uh, land use and what the, what the master plan wanted at the time. It would give you about a nine lot subdivision. While legally you could get 11, the site conditions pretty much limit it to nine. And these are large lots comparatively than what we're used to in the avenues. They're so large, in fact, that you can take almost a whole set of the townhome blocks and fit them into one lot. So these are large, and inevitably these become some of the least attainable housing options in the avenues. This is not what we want to do. This is not the best outcome for such a rare piece and such a rare infill piece in the city. Luckily, the city has changed since 1987. While the avenue's master plan hasn't, the city planning documents have. And they recognize that density is not something to fear. And when it can be minimally increased and when it can be rationally increased, it's a good thing. They also think that zone, uh, zoning can be a barrier to entry for people. It can cause housing shortages and it can exacerbate economic segregation. Growing SLC talks about several um, methods to reduce these, these negative impacts on the, housing, uh, on the housing market. In fact, they reference developing infills, infill properties as a uh, priority in that you can increase the housing stock, you can increase housing options, and you can all do this with very minimal impacts to the neighborhoods. Furthermore, Growing SLC did a big part in actually introducing the idea of ADUs as something to tackle the housing crisis with. Since then, we're now, we're now all aware that the state recognizes ADUs as something to promote, but Salt Lake was actually one of the leaders in this. At the time of the writing, ADUs were a very new concept to not be discouraged and to be promoted, rather. So taking these two tools, we want to get a zone that we can do something special with this property. I'm not showing the current site plan because the current site plan isn't done. I'm only showing this to show that we have been serious about including ADUs and a slightly uh, more dense project on here from the beginning. We've always been open about it. We've changed a little bit. We've changed since talking to staff and trying to fit into city ordinances. We've changed since talking to the community, believe it or not, and trying to uh, reduce neighborhood impacts. And right now we're changing because we're trying to react to engineering concerns. We are committed to doing this. Ooh, I'm running out of slides. Daniel, can I? Well, I have more slides, but I can't move through them. So, oh, there they are. Um, we're so committed to this that we've already built prototypes for what we want to do at the avenues. Um, this is a little three lot infill subdivision in Midvale called the Pines. We designed these homes for the avenues and said, let's go ahead and build them. Um, obviously, these aren't going to look like what we're planning for the avenues, but this is generally the same product type. And what we've learned from building these, is, other than how we want to change them, uh, is that there's a real market for this and that these types of homes are actually wanted and are helpful to families who are trying to get into homes that they otherwise would not be able to get into. It is stuck. In any case, I'll continue while this slide buffers. We don't believe that this is a radical rezone. We don't believe that preserving the current zone is in the best interest of the city. We think something radical is to accept a, a zone that has existed since 1987 and that is really expected to create exclusivity and to preclude inclusivity. I'm sorry I'm not able to move through my slides but I appreciate your time. I hope I've been brief enough. If we have an opportunity after public comment um, that we could respond. Oh, Daniel figured it out. So this was just put in there for context. We're already in one of the most diverse parts of the avenues, which are already one of the most diverse parts of the city. Would one more housing option hurt? Would moving from very low density to low density be considered extreme? So I ask the Planning Commission to recognize two things. The current zone is outdated. It no longer reflects the site conditions or the values of Salt Lake City. Furthermore, the requested zone is modest. But in its modesty, it creates an opportunity to remove some density barriers and promote a more diverse housing stock. Thank you all, and I am available for questions. OK, thank you. Um, commissioners, any questions for the applicant at this time? Yeah, I have a question. Um, the property slopes from north to south, is that correct? What is the approximate uh, 
elevation change from north to south? It's about 30 feet from north to south. So that's a slope of... <clears throat> Nick, do you mind joining us? Yes, Nick. We've got our engineer here with us. What's the percent? About 10%. Thank you. Thank you. And that also reflects the, the uh, percent of slope on F Street. It, is, it matches that across the site. But generally speaking, it's not perfect, but yeah. Okay. Any other questions, commissioners? Okay. So I'll have you hold tight. We'll open the public comment period, so get comfortable. And then once it's done, I'll give you the opportunity to respond to anything that may have come up. Um, to stay here. Yeah. It's easier if you do. Unless you really like your chair out there, and then I won't deny you. But Okay, we're going to open the public comment period. Um, I'm going to give some general instructions here. Because we have such a large crowd, we will start with the two community um, recognized community organizations, which will be the Greater Avenues and the um, Preserve Our Avenues Zoning Coalition. Um, but... For all of those in person, whether you're in this room or in the overflow room, we will be um, using baseball terminology, and Vice Chair Maureen will be calling names of who's up, who's on deck, and who's in the hole. So if you hear your name and you're across the hall or here, get ready to come over so that we can keep um, the meeting moving um, in an orderly and um, expedient way. Uh, you will be, everyone needs to speak at that lectern and you need to speak into the microphone. One, for the record, you'll state your name um, and then you'll have your two minutes, but also for those people participating on WebEx, they won't be able to hear you either unless you speak into the microphone. Um, I'm going to give you um, a little tip. Um, try to pay attention to the comments that you're hearing before you speak. Um, and, and really try not to be repetitive um, because what happens is two minutes goes by pretty quickly for some people and you end up repeating what's already been said and then you get to the point where you want to talk about something else and your two minutes are up. Um, so if you keep in mind and, and don't repeat, you'll be able to make more, more poignant um, comments for us to consider. Also, this is a public comment period, so it's not a back and forth Q&A. Um, if you have a question during your two minutes, feel free to ask them. I'll be writing them down, and after I close the public comment period, I will bring them up to staff or applicant. But we will not stop during that time to go back and forth. Um, but don't, don't hesitate to ask questions if you do. Okay, with that, did I get everything? Okay. Um, with that, we will um, welcome up Dave Alderman, who is the Greater Avenues Community Council representative. And Dave, you'll have up to five minutes as a community organization. Do you know Mark Levitt? You're on deck. Or in the hole. Oh. Sorry, you're in the hole. Okay. Madam Chair, Commissioners, my name is Dave Alderman. I am the past chair of the Greater Avenues Community Council. And I'm here tonight representing the GACC to uh, maintain the current master plan and FR3 zoning. The GACC has held several meetings with Ivory over this subject over the last couple of years, and in have, fact have held two separate votes, one in 2020 and one in 2021. The first vote was 688 in favor of keeping the existing plan and zoning to four in favor of change. And the second, zone, the second vote was 1,244 to 25 to maintain the current zoning. Because these are such large numbers, I, I want to give a little background on our community council and, and our processes. We covered the area from City Creek all the way across east of there and from South Temple North. So this is a large area, slightly less than 9,000 addresses. And we know this because we send out a monthly newsletter every month to everybody in the avenues trying to keep them informed of things like this. Um, every adult that resides in the community council area or has a business or owns property is a member of the community council. Our bylaws state that we provide a forum to discuss issues of mutual concern. We don't take a formal position without a vote of the community council. And before we can take a vote on an issue, we must publish it in our agenda, in our newsletter, that it will be for discussion at a monthly meeting 
And then if a vote is called at a second meeting, the vote will actually occur. This two-step process ensures that we have as much notice as possible before a vote. In July of 2020, we reviewed the first iteration of the project via Zoom, uh, and a vote was scheduled for the August meeting. Because we could not meet in person and we had attendance limits on our Zoom meeting, we allowed voting by email in addition to those that were actually at the Zoom meeting. And everyone that voted by email had to provide their name and street address to ensure that they were eligible to vote. And that vote, as I mentioned, was 688 to 4 to maintain our current zoning. Ivory took the comments, went back to the drawing board, and came back with a redesign with slightly less density. We reviewed this at our March 2021 meeting, and a vote was called for the April meeting. The vote this time was 1,244 to 25 to maintain the FR3 zoning. In both instances, articles were published in our newsletter with links to the city planning website and the Preserve Our Avenue Zoning Coalition website. As expected from so many voters, many different issues were raised. I won't go into the details now, as there is literally, a room, literally two roomfuls of people waiting to go over those dish issues with you. But I do want to express one concern. The master plans adopted by the city go through an extensive process with input from the communities and wide public participation opportunities. To arbitrarily throw out those plans in piecemeal fashion without similar community input seems to make a mockery of the entire master plan process, especially in an instance where the community has registered such overwhelming support for maintaining the existing master plan. Again, based on two overwhelming votes, the residents of the GACC support retaining the Foothills residential zoning. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. All right, next up is Peter Wright with the uh, Preserve Our Avenue Zoning Coalition. You just state your name for the record, and then you'll have five minutes. Uh, good evening. I'm Peter Wright, and I speak to you on behalf of the Preserve Our Avenue Zoning Coalition, a recognized community organization. We are not opposed to development and we're not opposed to ADUs. We understand the city's housing shortage and are prepared to accept a reasonable increase in density on this lot. However, Ivory's proposal is not reasonable. It is not even close to reasonable. In seeking to grow the housing stock in long established neighborhoods, the city has to strike a very careful balance between adding density and preserving neighborhood character. Ivory's proposal fails to achieve that balance and should be denied. Ivory looks to exploit three ordinances in combination. First, a rezone to go from a maximum of 11 lots to 19 lots. Secondly, an unprecedented use of the ADU ordinance to add an ADU to 14 of these newly created lots. Thirdly, Ivory seeks to misuse the plan development ordinance to gain more lots that would be possible under strict compliance with the new zone. This results in a development with 19 primary dwellings and 14 ADUs for a total of 33 dwellings. This is an approximately 200% increase in the number of lots and a 300% increase in the number of households. This is not reasonable. It is also not just a matter of how many units per acre, the size of the, the units also matters. Ivory's proposed development is of far higher building density than absolutely anything in the avenues. The houses with, with ADUs that Ivory refers to as cottages are not cottages. These are large, tall, two-story houses with four or five bedrooms and three car garages. The majority of Ivory's units with ADUs, including garages, are sized at 4,626 square feet. The primary unit living space is 3,353 square feet. The footprint of these houses at 2,100 square feet is so large that it's impossible to fit the homes onto a standard SR1 lot and meet setback requirements. While the avenues is eclectic, with a mix of homes, styles and sizes, Ivory's houses are not remotely typical of those found in the SR section, where most are older, smaller, single-story homes. A typical home in the SR zone is less than half the size of those proposed by Ivory. In fact, 
Ivory's houses are far more typical of those found in the adjacent Capitol Park neighborhood, zoned FR3. In short, Ivory wants a rezone put with FR3 size homes onto SR1 size lots. One at a time, this might be okay, but massing of 19 of these large, tall, two-story houses onto shrunken lots with reduced setbacks and minimal green space creates an extremely congested, high bulk appearance, not typical of the avenues, and not in compliance with the requirement to preserve neighborhood character. Lastly, for two years, we have suggested a solution that should satisfy all parties. Ivory's stated objective is to build a demonstration project featuring ADUs as original construction. However, this does not require a rezone. Ivory can build their demonstration project under current zoning with up to 11 primary dwellings and 11 ADUs. Ivory can satisfy their stated goal. The city would gain an increased number and variety of dwellings, and this Foothills property would not be overbuilt and spoilt. We ask that the near unanimous voice of thousands of Avenue's residents be heard. Maximizing density at all costs, as Ivory asks, will not win continued public support, and in the long run, will damage city policy and credibility. Please vote no to this application. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wright. Mark Lovett. Second. Sarah Van Voorhees. And Linda Dean is in the hole. My name is Mark Levitt. I would like to talk to you this evening about the, on the design aspects of Ivory's proposed development. Although you will not be making a decision on approval of that plan today, there is much to be learned in consideration of this design informing a decision on the appropriateness of this rezone. Building single-family detached homes on sloped lots requires space for grade transitions. This fundamentally is at odds with adding density to this requested SR1 zone. It has been mentioned on page 74 of the staff, staff report that even city personnel involved in the development approval process agree that the present, present ordinances often permit developments with insufficient lot sizes, yard area requirements, and so forth. In order to increase density, Ivory has proposed a design concept that pairs homes with paired homes with conjoined driveways mirrored on each side of the road, this requiring bulldozing of all the natural terrains to create multi-lot terraces or building platforms with height differentials of up to 17 feet. This in turn requires an extensive network of retaining walls running both north, south, and east, west to support these terraces. Ivory's design contains 1,625 feet of retaining walls creating a visual nuisance consuming side and rear yard setbacks and interspersing so many tall retaining walls tightly wedged between tall closely packed houses creating a very high bulk and dense appearance. It is easy to criticize Ivory's design and there is so much to criticize, but the issue is more fundamental than Ivory's poor design choices. Other than going vertical, there is no good way to add density on these highly sloped lots. This is one of the reasons why the city ordinances limit lot sizes and density in our foothill regions. Consider, consideration of Ivory's design tells us that this lot should remain zoned as FR3, That's leaving time. room for grade transitions. Thank you, Mr. Wright. Thank you. Or Mr. Levitt, sorry. Okay, Sarah Voorhees, you're up. Linda Dean, you're on deck. Daniel Payne, you're in the hole. Good evening, my name is Sarah Van Voris and I live at 133 P Street. I was born and raised in Salt Lake City and I graduated from the University of Utah and I'm a practicing attorney. I'd like to read part of the legal requirement under the Salt Lake City Code of Ordinances related to the purpose of SR1 Special Development Pattern Residential District. Quote, the purpose of SR1 is to maintain the unique character of older, predominantly single family and two family dwelling neighborhoods, the display of variety of yards, lot sizes, and bulk characteristics. Uses are intended to be compatible with the existing scale and intensity of the neighborhood. It further states a planned development does not negate this obligation to comply with the requirements of the underlying zone. 
Ivory's proposed development does not meet this legal requirement and therefore should be denied. Ivory's proposed buildings are tall, two-story houses with four to five bedrooms, three car garages, and ADUs. Only 26% of the homes in SR1A zone of the avenues are two-story, and there is not one single block in the avenues where all of the homes in that block are two-story houses, and yet this is what Ivory is proposing. Only 15% of the homes in the SR1A zone even have an attached garage, much less a three-car garage. Where larger homes do exist, they are on larger lots interspersed with smaller single-story homes. Ivory's proposal to build almost 20 large two-story homes with three-car garages and ADUs onto a three-acre plot with minuscule lots is not compatible with the existing scale and intensity of the neighborhood and therefore does not comply with the legal requirement as stated in the SR1 purpose statement. If this city is going to comply with its own ordinances, Ivory's request for a rezone from FR3 to SR1 should be denied. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Anvoris. Linda Dean, you're up. Daniel Payne, you're on deck. Bob Kinney, you're in the hole. Hello, my name is Linda Dean, and I live at 400 East Capitol Park Avenue. The city's five-year housing plan and many of its ordinances, including the ADU ordinance, advocate that density be added to walkable parts of the city, close to mass transit, jobs, and amenities. 675 North F Street is not such a location. The proposed ivory development is over a mile down a steep grade to South Temple and two miles to Harmon City Creek Mall. So walking or cycling up and down to the city is totally impractical for most people. The closest grocery store is Smith's located on 6th Avenue. The streets between 13th and 6th Avenue are incredibly steep. It is not at all feasible to walk between Smith's and Ivory's development with grocery bags during temperate months, let alone when it is snowy and icy. In fact, it can be really dangerous, especially during the winter months, given there are intermittent sidewalks between 11th and 13th Avenue. The information provided in Ivory's application with regard to the bus service to 675 North S Street is incorrect. Currently, there is an 11th Avenue flex bus, which runs weekdays once an hour between LDS Hospital and the University of Utah Medical Center. The bus does not go downtown. Furthermore, there is no service on weekends, and when it is snowy and icy, no buses go above 3rd Avenue for safety reasons. All of these considerations show that the automobiles are the only practical means of transportation to and from the proposed development with all the attendant environmental problems. The current zoning of FR3 is far more appropriate for this area. There is no infrastructure time, to Ms. support Dean. the density Ivory is proposing. Thank you for your comments. Last is I appreciate your time. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Daniel Payne, you're up. Hey, my name's Daniel Payne. Wait, wait, Thanks for your... Give me one second. Just give me one second. Bob Kinney, you're next. And Gary Crittenden, you're in the hole. Go ahead. Thanks. Go ahead. Uh, we live in an amazing city in no small part to the service of people like you. So thanks for all you do and for making our community so awesome. I was born in LDS Hospital, grew up in the avenues. And when I outgrew my house on Elizabeth Avenue with my third kid, I moved over to bought a lot in Capitol Park um, and had my fourth kid. My wife and our four kids live there on a 0.67 acre lot um, that I love because I love to work in the yard, and I love my green space, and I love planting trees and working my fl flowers, and I love my neighbors walking by and waving hi to them. Um, but if you put the same amount of houses on my .67 lot, you'd be putting seven houses, okay? I live four houses away fr from this development. My friend John lives two houses away. He lives on an acre. I'd be putting 10 houses on his, on his property. And that's fine, we love neighbors and stuff like that, but we also like green space. And the problem with that development is that they're, they're putting it all on one thing. They're not going up, they're going out with infrastructure. And so there's going to be very, very little green, green space. But there's a bigger problem. Because of the master plan, above 11th Avenue was designed for bigger houses. 
and the infrastructure doesn't support it up there. The only thing I can see is the sidewalks. There's, no, there's very little sidewalks in front of people's houses. In fact, there's no contiguous sidewalks down to 11th Ave or any public transportation. So what you have is you have lots of people that walk their dogs and walk their, walk their kids in the streets. You're gonna have a lot more traffic. We've already had 15 fatalities this year. It's gonna be a problem. And that's just what I can see. I know we're redoing the sewers and the whole, the whole downtown, but I'm sure we got the same problems underground. It just doesn't support it. I think you did a great job with the ADUs and just leave it like it is. I mean, don't give them 33 units there. They're gonna get 20, 20, 22. Great, I want love new neighbors and I'm all for development. So let's do it, but let's not press the system until we can figure out what we need underground Thank and what you. we need above ground That's time. to make it keep people safe. Thank you, Thank Mr. You. Payne. I appreciate your comments. Okay, Bob Kinney, you're up. Gary Crittenden, you're on deck. And Judy Denker is in the hole. My name is Bob Kinney. My wife and I used to live on the corner of 13th and F Street, directly across from the property in question. But we sold our house late last year, following the lead of our neighbors directly to the north of us, both of us selling our homes in large part to escape what would be a disaster for this part of the avenue should Ivory's proposal be approved. My comments today will focus on the impact this zoning change would have on traffic in the area. That is to say, it will increase exponentially. With 33 new units, Ivory's development could be expected to add upwards to, of 70 cars, which according to Ivory's own traffic study will add some 114,000 trips per year to our already busy streets. Residents in the area also are also concerned with the number of accidents that will likely occur in the winter months as F Street is steep. And although Daniel mentioned earlier in his comments that there have been historically a low number of accidents along the street, I'm sure his numbers don't take into account the number of cars that slide into lawns and end up in snowbanks in the winter. I also believe the Planning Commission should take into account the impact that up to 70 cars will have on Salt Lake's inversion, where the polluted air hangs over the valley for much of the winter. The first year I stood on my porch witnessing this, I felt bad for the folks across the valley until I realized I was breathing the same polluted air. Unless you think we didn't act on this, we did purchase an electric car to do our small part to help lessen this growing concern. And for those who think that the same number of cars would result regardless of where a project of this density is built, I would argue not. A project that proposes to put 33 homes into a postage stamp sized lot should be built near public transit and local retail establishments. That is not this location. Just because Ivory thinks they have come up with a plan to jam 33 dwelling units into this site does not mean they should. It will create too many problems, many you will hear tonight, for the residents who chose to live in the upper avenues for its foothills quality, a quality that will be dramatically altered, if not destroyed, That's if this time. rezoning proposal is approved. Thank you, Mr. Thank King. you. Okay, Gary Crittenden, you're up. Judy Denker, you're on deck, and Sarah DeLong, you're in the hole. Thank you, I'm uh, Gary Crittenden. I fully understand that the city ha faces a housing shortage and I support reasonable policies to increase the housing stock. I'm not opposed to auxiliary dwelling units. The policy, however, should not allow for maximum density without consideration of the location and the circumstances. You have the difficult job of trying to balance the perspective of, of a uh, profit-seeking developer with the impact that it has on Salt Lake City neighborhoods. I have three reasons that I'd like to discuss with you tonight that I think are very important for you to consider. The first is this neighborhood is in a, a, a high-risk wildfire zone. If you live in and around that area, you experience and see that every day. You're aware that we had a fire in the Marmalade District last year. Should we have a similar fire here, the high density of the ivory plan would both impede firefighting and put life and properties at risk. Why would you vote for a zoning amendment that actually increases an already identified high risk? Second, maximum density is supposed to reduce our dependency on cars. This plan does not do that. It doesn't meet the objective of that zoning change. We don't have much public transportation here, as people have said. If you want to go, to, you have to be very fit if you're going to go down to the grocery store to pick up some groceries and walk up the hill. I'd argue you'd need to be a triathlete to walk from City Creek Canyon up to the top of the avenues. 
Why would you approve a zoning change where one of the objectives for the change in zoning is to reduce the amount of uh, uh, cars that have to actually be on the road? Third, this plan is totally out of character for our neighborhood. Let me just give you one simple example. I could be wrong, I'm a layperson, but my read of their plan indicates that the, uh, the retaining wall on the back side of the property will actually be 25 feet high. They need this because the natural slope of the property doesn't work for their densely packed, affordable $1 million homes. I sent Daniel a That's note asking, asking that he drive down to 4th East where you can see these 25 Thank foot you. retaining Thank walls. You, Thank, you. Thank you, Mr. Crittenden. Thank you. Okay, Judy Denker, you're up next. Sarah DeLong, you're in the hole, or on deck. And Dirk Van Clareren is in the hole. Hello, my name is Judy Danker. I am third generation in my home on 13th Avenue, also called the Dry Bench, as it is, as it is historically known. As this hearing deals with zoning change request at 675F, I would like to know how many times Avenue's homeowners have to say no to the proposed ivory zoning change. In the past two plus years, over 2,100 Avenue's residents have said no by signing a petition opposing ivory zoning change and development. Also, you have heard from the GACC on their numbers for two surveys that they did, both of them overwhelmingly against this zoning change. 654 letters have been written to the planning division by Avenue's residents to be forwarded to you folks. And they are, 637 of them are against the zoning change. That is 97% against the rezone. We love and we want to keep the unique features of our Avenue's home. We do not want to become another high-density spot in Salt Lake City. We love our small interface with the foothills. It is our neighborhood. We have the right and obligation to strongly oppose the requested zoning change. We expect you, the zoning or the planning commission, to protect our right to quiet enjoyment in our long-established neighborhood and to deny the zoning change request. You are to be an impartial body and must find in favor of overwhelming number of Avenue's residents who do not agree to a zoning change. In closing, thousands of Avenue's residents and taxpayers have repeatedly said no to this overly dense development that will destroy the character of our neighborhood, and I hope we are not to be ignored. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Dinker, that's time. I just wanna um, remind folks in the overflow room that um, the rules extend across the hall for no clapping and cheering. Um, so please take note of that and act accordingly. All right, who's up next? Sarah DeLong, you're, you're up. Dirk Van Claren, you're on deck. And Catherine Kennedy, you're in the hole. Thank you for your time. I would just like to ask the planning uh, committee to if ask you would how just they state would- your name for the record, sorry. This is Sarah DeLong. Okay live on 13th Avenue. I would ask the planning committee to consider how they would feel to learn that the 22 new cars that they were planning on next door are now well over double that. I'd ask you to consider the factors that you thought about when you were choosing where you would live. And I imagine that traffic patterns were part of that consideration, especially if you have children. I know that uh, trying to teach a kid how to ride a bike on a street with no sidewalks you know, 70 cars doesn't sound a whole lot, but, but that adds up pretty quick and seems scary pretty fast. You know, I've also had to do some soul searching with this proposal to consider if I'm one of those not in my backyard kind of people, which I don't really identify as. Affordable housing is really in alignment with my values, but I think this is different because this is not that. This is not affordable housing. These are million plus dollar homes. This feels like a for-profit corporation profiting at the cost of local residents, the safety of our kids, and potentially the property values of our home from increased traffic congestion. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. DeLong. Okay, Dirk Van Claren, you're up. Catherine Kennedy, you're on deck. And Katie Davis, you're in the hole. 
Good evening. I'm Dirk Van Claveren, an 18-year resident of the Avenues. It is the oldest trick in the book. A developer buys a property in a choice part of town and then invents some story as to why the city should rezone the property so it can increase the number of houses it can sell at a premium price. Ivory knew what the zone was when they purchased the property. So what is Ivory's story? They say they want to build a development with ADUs incorporated as part of the original construction. An experiment, they say, the first of its kind in Utah, they tell us. So why do they need a rezone to do this? What they want to do can be done under the current zone without the extreme density. ADUs are permitted in all single family zones, which, which includes the FR3 zone. Higher density, higher profits, and the Avenue's residents are left with the negative effects of the high density. Is it beneficial to the community for the lot to be rezoned? Avenue's residents have overwhelmingly stated that they do not want it rezoned. Please listen to the Avenue's Community Council comments. The upper avenues lack the infrastructure to handle density. There is no meaningful public support, no amenities, Cars existing for the development, excuse me, cars existing for the development onto the private road that the city does not want because it does not meet their standards. I would encourage your strong consideration to deny this rezone. Please don't let us fall for the oldest trick in the book. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Hey, Catherine Kennedy, you're up. Katie Davis, you're on deck. Evie Warmbier. Evie Warmbier, you're um, in the hole. Members of the Planning Commission, good evening. My name is Katherine Kennedy. I've been an Avenues resident for 26 years. My child designed the new city flag, one of two designers behind you and I represent the Avenues on the Salt Lake City School Board. I speak on behalf of myself tonight and not the school board, and I oppose Ivory Homes' rezone, request to rezone the lot at F Street and 13th Avenue because I believe it will endanger school children who live in the Avenues by dramatically increasing the number of cars commuting to and from that property. I encourage you to, to uh, commission your own neutral study because I do not believe that the number will be 5%. Adding more cars to this area will also increase traffic to all the main access streets that traverse the avenues, including streets leading to our elementary schools and to the middle school that serves our neighborhood. There are other reasons why adding any additional cars to this area is particularly dangerous for children. The proposed rezone is across the street from the bus stop closest to West High School in the avenues. This bus stop serves students age 11 to 18. Because it is the closest bus stop, many students use this location. These students often meet the bus in the dark for several months during the year. Adding additional cars increases the danger for these often sleepy students as they hurry to catch the bus to school in the morning. None of the blocks that surround the development have consistent sidewalks on both sides of the street. Some blocks have no sidewalks. All children ages 5 to 18 who meet the bus or who walk to school must either cross streets to get to a sidewalk or walk in the street where there is no sidewalk. Adding any additional commuters increases the danger to children walking to school or to their bus stop. Finally, this area has some of the steepest streets in the avenues. Cars may be unable to stop when children are present if they are traveling too quickly or if the streets are slippery with water, ice, snow, or leaves. This is especially true of F Street, immediately adjacent to the property development and where West, the West High bus stop is located. I'll add that these expensive homes with no R yards will not attract families time, with Kennedy. young children. Thank you. And I urge the commission to deny Ivory Homes' proposal. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Okay, Katie Davis, you're up. It, Audrey, how about Don Warmbier? Is he here? Okay, so Don Warmbier, you're on deck. And Larry Perkins, you're in the hole. 
Good evening, my name is Katie Davis and I'm an Avenues resident since 2012, a nurse practitioner providing primary care in downtown Salt Lake City and a mother of two young children. Ladies and gentlemen of the Planning Commission, the city is adding thousands of rental apartments all over. You see it in every work session you have. The flow continues unabated. Ivory is not fulfilling an unsatisfied need by creating a few more rental units for singles or couples. Talk to real estate agents in the community and they will tell you that Salt Lake City has an acute shortage of single family homes to accommodate larger families with three or four kids or more. Utah does still have such large families who also need housing. If we do not provide this type of housing, such families which make up the lifeblood of our community will leave the city. Ivory's houses with no yards will not attract families with young children. No parent is gonna allow young children to go out and play out of sight in Ivory's drainage basin they call a private park. Kids need yards to play in. We all know this. The city wants to promote diversity across all aspects of city life. And I agree, we need diversity of housing that includes larger single family homes to accommodate families with kids. We need more of this housing in the avenues close to Ensign Elementary. The plot of land on the corner of Capitol Park and F Street is the ideal location for such zoning. The east side of the city has declining school enrollment, which is threatening school closures, and this includes Ensign Elementary a school with a reputation for excellence. In large part, this decline in school enrollment is due to a lack of suitable housing to accommodate families with kids. We are all enriched by diversity. Please, I ask that the diversity include the need for housing to accommodate large families and homes with yards. The zoning on this lot should remain as it is. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Davis. So Dan Warmbier, you're up. Don, if you will, please. Huh? Don Warmbier. Don. And then Larry Perkins, you're on deck. I'm Don Warmbier. And Drew Hall, you're in the hole. I'm sorry. Now. Now go. you can go. I'm Don Warmbier, a resident of North, North Point. The planning division says it has no concerns with fire department access to North Point in a wildfire if, after a rezone, F Street meets the same fire code requirements as a street anywhere in the city. But this is not anywhere in the city. This is a wildland urban interface, the city's highest wildfire risk area. In a wildland urban interface, the Salt Lake Fire Department in its guide to fire adjusted, ad, fire adapted communities calls not just for fire code compliance, it calls for quote, proactive land use planning to actually decrease the risk of damage from future wildfires. The planning division simply ignores this fire department document. Uh, North Point's 50 homes have only one exit and entrance via F Street next to Ivory's property. The rezone would allow homes with 20 cars on this choke point, three times the number as existing zoning. On-street parking would more often narrow F Street and delay fire vehicles trying to reach North Point and North Point residents trying to get out. I ask the Planning Commission to exercise the proactive land use planning that the fire department calls for by rejecting the rezone. Or the Planning Commission can flip off the fire department and maximize future ivory profits by approving the rezone. Maximize wildfire safety, like the fire department says, or maximize ivory profits. Maximize Thank wildfire you. safety Thank you, or Mr. maximize ivory profits. Thank you, Mr. Morbier. Okay, Larry Perkins, you're up. Drew Hall, you're on deck. And Lon Jenkins, you're in the hole. My name is Larry Perkins. I've lived in the avenues 30 years. I live uh, one block south of this property that Ivory is asking you to rezone and I'm the treasurer of the Capitol Park uh, Homeowners Association. <clears throat> I 
we, we, our homeowners association built the private roads that serve our communities. One of those roads is Capitol Park Avenue. Capitol Park Avenue was built, designed with a capacity for low density like FR3 zoning, uh, and going from 12,000 foot lots to 5,000 foot lots is absolutely not a small change. It's a matter of 41%, of 5,000 is 41% of uh, 12,000. You get two and a half times otherwise. Uh, although Capitol Park and Meridian HOAs petitioned the city to take over ownership and maintenance of Capitol Park Avenue for some years ago. The city denied that request because they observed that Capitol Park Avenue does not meet city street guidelines. It's too narrow to be a city street. So Capitol Park was paid for and is currently maintained and owned by us. Ivory is now asking you to rezone property that they, that they bought from the uh, LDS church. That property has an easement allowing one curb cut access into Capitol Park Avenue. That easement was granted with the expectation that it would be one of three access points into a church parking lot. It was expected that that uh, access point would be used with moderate traffic and mostly on Sunday mornings. Uh, now Ivory wants to use that Capitol Park Avenue access point as the only access point into every dwelling that they plan to build except for five. Occupants cars, visitors cars, delivery trucks, moving trucks, uh, garbage trucks, snow plows, fire trucks, Thank all you. vehicles focused. Thank did you, did you say Perkins, I was time? That's time. Boy, I need to talk faster. Sorry. <laughs> No, it does go by fast. Thank you, Mr. Perkins. Okay, Drew Hall, you're up. Do I see Drew Hall somewhere? Lon Jenkins is on deck, and Nate Dean is in the hall. All right, we'll move on from Drew Hall. Drew Hall going once, twice. Okay, Lon Jenkins. Got it, and thank then you. Jill Kinney would be in the hole now. We just made Go it. ahead. Go ahead, Mr. Oh, Don Hall. All right, yeah, thank go you. Go ahead, Mr. Jenkins. Uh, good evening. My name is Lon Jenkins. I'm a resident of North Point. A few weeks ago, members of the Planning Commission heard a presentation from the Planning Division advocating an affordable housing initiative whereby the city would grant zoning concessions to developers in exchange for the creation of affordable ho housing. In its request, Ivory now seeks a series of concessions from the city that are far greater than those envisioned in the affordable housing initiative, but it creates no affordable housing. By Ivory's own admission, the units with ADUs will be priced in excess of $1 million, and the rentals of ADUs, if any, will be at market rates. The five custom homes on F Street will be uh, likely in the range of $2 million. This is not affordable housing, and it's made even less affordable by the fact that mortgage rates are now increasing, approaching seven or six or seven percent. Any resulting increase in affording housing is illusory at best. It's unlikely the purchasers in the ivory development will be freeing up affordable housing elsewhere in the Salt Lake Valley. Given the price points, those purchasers are likely moving from housing that is not affordable housing to new housing that is equally not affordable housing. It's easy to see what Ivory is getting from its concessions, but what is the city getting? As you've all heard, the ADUs, or will hear, the ADUs are extremely questionable. The city's affordable housing initiative wisely limits its plan to sections of the city that are close to public transit, recognizing the need for density in those areas. As you've heard, the Upper Avenues area does not have access to public transportation, and realistically, residents are going to be using private vehicles uh, to, uh, for their transportation, and this, of course, will harm the air quality. The city's own policies recognize this is not the right place for excessive density. Ivory's application does nothing to help with affordable housing. Thank you, it Mr. Jensen, that's time. Muted. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Jenkins. I believe Mr. Hall is right behind you. Okay, let's cycle back to you. Okay, so Drew Hall, you're up. Nate Dean, you're on deck. And then Jill Kinney, you're in the hole. Go ahead. 
Thank you. My name is Drew Hall. I live at 416 12th Avenue, one block directly below the project site. I have been a real estate developer for 45 years. I have rezoned thousands of acres of property and have developed several thousand residential lots in the states of Washington and Utah. I just finished 78 residential lots and will begin another 55 lots this month. I have done business with dozens of residential home builders and I have attended over 200 planning commission meetings. Note, I have never seen such an intelligent, broad-based, and passionate opposition to a rezone. There are many positive reasons for rezoning property, but from a professional standpoint, this request does not meet generally accepted land use standards. I was also a practicing CPA for 25 years and belonged to the American Institute of Certified Public Accountants. I respect property rights. Ivory is entitled to develop this land based on the zoning in place at their purchase. This subject site is ideal for development at current zoning. I have run the numbers. For simplicity, I will ignore the ADUs. If Ivory built 11 homes allowed at current zoning, their gross revenue would be 25 million. The land cost was 2.8 million. The maximum build cost would be 12.5 million. Sales cost at 6% is 1.5 million. The profit, therefore, would be 8.2 million. So I ask the question, why are we here? Does this rezone help fight climate change? Does it create affordable housing? Or does it protect wildlife habitat? No, none of the above. The obvious reason for the rezone is to double Ivory's profit based on a careful accounting to 16.4 million. You represent the people, not Ivory Homes. You should forward a negative recommendation. Thank you, Mr. Thank Hall. You. Thank you. Okay, Nate Dean, you're up. Oh. Oh. Thank you. I'm uh, Nate. One, one second, please. Oh, sorry. Uh, Jill Kinney. You're on deck, and Paul McKinnon, you're in the hole. Thank you, go ahead. Thank you. I'm Nathan Dean. I'm an academic pulmonary physician at Intermountain Medical Center and the University of Utah. My group has published research linking Wasatch Front air pollution with increased rate, mortality, and deaths, or severity, and deaths from pneumonia. Salt Lake City's air pollution increases the rate of lung cancer and heart attacks, aggravates asthma, COPD, and other lung diseases. While only two miles away, the property's elevation is more than 600 feet above downtown Salt Lake City, and as others have said, is not served by public transportation. The planning staff has dismissed these concerns by writing that it's better to have a car-centric, dense development up a steep hill near downtown than one further away that might be walkable, bikeable, near restaurants, stores, and with good public transportation. Packing homes and ADUs into this lot will add 70 new cars and trucks 100,000 times a year and produce emissions that will worsen air quality in our neighborhood and in the city. Short drives to and from the development with cold engines burning fossil fuels will produce high levels of pollutants. Ivory's design with conjoined driveways will lead to extensive shuttling of cars and further emissions. While Ivory suggests that they will provide charging outlets, the reality is that fewer than 5% of Utah residents drive electric vehicles. Utah Physicians for Healthy Environment, of which I am a member, opposes Ivory's proposal for all these reasons. It's about our health. To conclude, Ivory's proposal will considerably worsen avenues and Salt Lake City air quality, as well as worsening climate change. The F Street lot is not appropriate for a dense development enabled by this zoning change. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dean. Uh, Jill Kinney, and then Paul McKinnon, and then we're going to take a break. And we're going to pause and take a break, so go ahead. Good evening. I am Jill Kinney. FR3 zoning limits development in our Foothill neighborhoods by restricting lot sizes to a minimum of 12,000 square feet. It does so to minimize flooding, erosion, and other environmental hazards, and to protect wildlife. Do we no longer care about preserving our fragile foothills environment? Do we no longer care about protecting wildlife? Is, it, is the only metric maximum housing density, regardless of location? 
12,000 square feet is required by FR3 zoning, equates to a density of 3.63 dwellings per acre. Ivory's development has a density of 10.3 dwellings per acre, which is three times the zone limit. North Point to the north meets the FR3 density requirement, as does the adjacent, adjacent block to the east on F Street, as does Capitol Park, which lies to the west and to the south. The only exception to FR3 zoning in the immediate neighborhood are the Meridian and Wright buildings, which are condominium conversions of the old VA hospital and its annex. Even these have a density half of that of ivory. Ivory points to the existence of these historic buildings as justification for their overly dense development. There is no equivalency. These beautiful neoclassical buildings listed on the National Register of Historic Places had either to be repurposed or demolished. Thankfully, Ivory did not purchase them and this important part of Salt Lake City's medical heritage was preserved. Avenue residents are not stupid. The conversion of the VA hospital to condominiums was widely welcomed by the neighborhood while the community sees Ivory's development for what it is, a poorly designed, overly dense development that is not compatible with the, and does not preserve neighborhood character. Ivory's application for a rezone should be denied. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Kinney. Paul McKinnon. Good, uh, good evening, my name is Paul McKinnon. I live uh, on Capitol Park Avenue. Uh, as you have heard, people in the avenues have expressed their views on this proposal. 2,100 petition signatures against the zoning change. Two GAC votes, 688 to four and 1,244 to 25, both against. 654 letters. 97% against. And these are not just people close to the lot. These are people who live across the avenues and are speaking out because they know if Ivory is allowed to do it here, they can do it anywhere in the avenues. I would ask the commission, could it, the, the, how the people feel be any more clear than those numbers? Regardless of the wishes of the residents, Ivory is flexing their muscles to have this zoning change. This is the fourth plan that they have submitted. The first three were retracted before there was a ruling, and now they've requested a zoning change even though their fourth plan is incomplete. It is not surprising that the Ivory-sponsored study suggests that the impact to the neighborhood will be nominal without question, doubling the numbers of dwellings will increase traffic and congestion. The neighborhood is not built for this. Current zoning allows them to build 11 spacious homes and 11 ADUs. That should be enough for any developer, but apparently it is not enough for Ivory. Thank you, Mr. McKinnon. With that, I'm going to uh, put us in recess for five minutes so we can take a break and we'll reconvene at 7.08.
again, remind those folks across the hall that we can hear you when you are clapping and cheering, so to please stop that to comply with our rules of decorum. This is your final reminder on that behavior. Okay, Maureen, we're gonna recommence our public comment period. Okay, Scott Young, you're up. Evie Warmbier, you're on deck. Julie Thompson, you're in the hole. Yep, go ahead. I'm Scott Young. I live in Capitol Park. Capitol Park and the Meridian properties border the Ivory property and decades ago were part of Primary Children's. When Primary Children's sold its property, Salt Lake City imposed restrictive covenants because it was concerned about how the property would be developed. The city stated land use should be very low density residential. Quote, access to these sites is through narrow residential streets traversing relatively steep topography and there are no retail services or other facilities to support uses other than very low density residential. The master plan also confirms that, quote, as a general policy, additional zoning changes to accommodate higher density multiple family dwellings in the avenues are not desirable. Despite all of this, Ivory seeks rezoning to build a high density development that is not compatible with the existing neighborhood. Ivory simply wants the city to disregard all of the rules that apply to everyone else so Ivory can maximize profits. Ivory bought the property with full knowledge of the current zoning requirements. Ivory's rezoning request is not fair to the surrounding property owners that were restricted by the city. Ivory's development should comply with the current zoning and be consistent with the surrounding neighborhoods. Each homeowner in our neighborhood bought their home and invested in our neighborhood in reliance on the low density residential zoning. Ivory should abide by the same rules and restrictions that apply to everyone else in the neighborhood. It is completely unfair to change the rules now. Ivory's rezoning request should be rejected. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Young. Okay, Evie Warmbier, you're up. Julie Thompson, you're on deck. Joseph Cook, you're in the hole. Go ahead, please. I can start? Mm-hmm. Oh, I'm on deck, okay. I'm Evie, I'm Evie Warmbier and I'm a resident of North Point. And I'd first like to reference the tender box awaits a spark article in the Salt Lake Tribune. And this was in June 22nd and it talks about our risk and it says 99% of Utah remains in severe drought. And basically a week or two of very hot, very dry temperature with wind can give us big fires that we're all concerned about. North Point and Ivory's property are in a wild, uh, wildland urban interface, part of the city at highest risk for wildfires. Fast spreading and wind driven wildfires recently reached North Point's one mile long border of City Creek Canyon. We had a fire there and before the fire department came, we had residents with their hoses trying to deal with this. Remember the fire in Paradise in California? My son was coming home from college and he sent me a picture of what he was leaving and it was a plume of black smoke. It destroyed 11,000 properties and killed 85 people. Remember the biggest problem that I saw and you probably saw as well, they couldn't get out of there. And that's kind of what we're looking at at North Point. We have one way to get out one way to get out. And there are about 50 homes at North Point, and then with, with uh, what Ivory wants to put in, we're all gonna end up on F Street, right? Our roads are not, on the avenues, are not like the roads in the city where the fire department says, oh, it's okay, you know, we've got wide enough streets. No, the avenues and, and our, our area in North Point, they are different, they're narrow. Think about this, fires can start anywhere. Garage, grills, O2 tanks, smoker, smokers, furnaces not taken care of. And so I'm gonna tell you what I've told my students when I teach my nurses. 
remember your vote regarding Thank zoning. Think about the consequences Thank you, that's of time. not doing the right thing. Thank, Thank you, Ms. about Marvier. the consequences. I appreciate that. And I tell my nurses, Thank I want to see your that time's light bulb. Up. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Julie Thompson. Then Joseph Cook is on deck, and Tom Kern is in the hole. I thank you for your time. I'm Julie Tom Julianne Thompson, and I thank those that went before me. Um, be besides endangering our children coming and going from school, it could cause traffic jams. In times of emergency, this is a follow-up on what Edie was talking about. Um, I, uh, I mean fires and medical. I'm familiar with both. A few years ago, I ended up fighting a fire behind our condo. Complications had kept the firemen from arriving quickly and getting into us. The fire department said, evacuate, but I told them, too late. Uh, my neighbor joined me and standing next to each other, we couldn't even see each other in the smoke and the flames. Very dangerous situations and very frightening. We need to, to take these things into account. My husband had to be taken to the hospital twice by the paramedics when he was in a coma. I knew I have a neighbor who just the other day, who lives in our area, had to be emergency uh, taken by the paramedics. And had she not gotten there quickly, she'd have died. Um, an area with that many cars could create de very dangerous situations. Also, the parking. Where are you going to park when you overpark? Is it going to be on F Street or is it going to be on Capitol Park? Either way, you're causing congestion. I have one last question. Do our voices count? After hearing about the request to rezone, we've done so much work in, in letting the councils know about the way we feel and why we feel that way. Um, and so I hope that as you put your request or as you put your proposal into the city council, you will remember what you have heard here from the residents of the area. And if so, you will deny the application Thank you, to Ms. the result. Thank, Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Okay, Joseph Cook, you're up. Tom <clears throat> Kern, or maybe it's Keen, uh, is on deck. And then Vern Rice is in the hole. Good evening. My name is Joseph Cook. I'm a family physician. I've lived in North Point, uh, had property there for 31 years. Uh, I'm going to speak to two issues. The first is the, the health and safety. I, I think that's been covered very well by uh, many speakers. Uh, there's a pollution issue. There's a very big issue in terms of density. Yeah, F Street in particular, that I'm used to going up and down, uh, you can't get up it in the winter unless you have four-wheel drive, and when you try to go down, you slick and it's slick and you slide, and uh, Kathleen Kennedy Ewan has pointed out the problems with the school children. There's a real safety problem with increased density. The second point I, I want to make is I believe in, in grassroots democracy. Uh, this is the fourth time that Ivory has brought a proposal forward. Think of the enormous time and energy we've all spent in opposing those proposals one at a time while they work to uh, get something that would meet uh, their needs. I seldom have seen an instance in my life where so many people have been so vehemently opposed to something. And if you believe in grassroots democracy and in a neighborhood democracy, then I think that's ample reason to reject this proposal. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cook. Okay, Tom, Keen or Kern? I can't read the writing. Keen, okay, you're up. Vern Rice, you're on deck. And Cindy Van Clauren is in the hole. My name is Tom Keen. I live in the Capitol Park subdivision, and I oppose the Ivory rezoning request. Ivory has used the following words to describe its development scheme. It's an experiment. 
It's a first of its kind in Utah and a demonstration project of sorts. Its offer to the city is, give us the rezoning and we'll give you 14 ADUs instead of the 11 that current zoning permits. But Ivory can't guarantee any ADUs. The current ordinance only permits individual owner occupants to do that. And before the ordinance was adopted, the public was told that it's only one at a time and it's not a subdivision. But the, an ADU subdivision is exactly what Ivory is proposing. And the planning, commission, the planning division is incentivizing it by recommending a rezoning which will double the number of buildable lots and double oh. Ivory's profits. In its rush to promote ADUs, the planning division is ignoring legal limitations of the current ADU ordinance. It is also promoting future revisions to the ordinance, which, if adopted, would make it easy for developers and house flippers to create ADUs in any residential neighborhood of the city. Creating an ADU was supposed to be the property right of an individual homeowner, and ADUs were supposed to, be, to seamlessly blend into our neighborhoods. The precedent setting ivory experiment threatens to change all that. The stormwater retention base in ivory will need to build to compensate for the overly dense development will be an unmistakable and unique addition to the avenues. Ivory admits it would be easy to develop the site under FR3 zoning. If the city is determined to permit an Thank experiment you, to King, take place in time. our neighborhood, Thank you, confine Mr. it King. to that zoning. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Vern Rice, you're up. Cindy Van Clauren, you're on deck. And Al Hayes, you're in the hole. Hello, I am uh, Vern Rice. I live in North Point. They're my neighbor. When we moved there 15 years ago, we saw this nice undeveloped land to the south. We didn't worry about it as we were told the church owned that land and we were confident they would uh, put up something that was attractive and a credit. Then the church sold. Uh oh, we thought. But uh, we took comfort in the zoning and thought what would be put there couldn't be that dense, and surely any developer would respect the nearby neighbors. But then a developer bought and wants to put there a bunch of structures that are incompatible with adjacent homes and surroundings and create traffic problems, especially in uh, exiting escape. Surely, we thought the city would respect the neighbors and not allow something like that. But here we are. The developer apparently wants to pack over 30 structures into that three acres, residents believe that the proposed development is way out of character with the surroundings. It's hard to understand why the city would not respect the overwhelming wishes of residents who are most affected. Perhaps this dense project is appropriate in uh, expanding residential areas, but that's not what we got here. It seems out of place, packed, in this established neighborhood. I can see why a developer who doesn't live in our neighborhood wants to maximize its investment, but it's hard to understand why the city would press ahead Thank on you, a plan so That's universally uh, Thank you, disgusted Rice. by the neighbors. Thank you, Mr. Rice. Hey, Cindy Van Clauren. Then Al Hayes is on deck, and Cynthia Connor is in the hole. Go ahead. My name is Cindy Van Claveren, and I live at North Point. As a former HOA chair, I know that developments at this elevation must plan for large amounts of snow removal and storage. North Point has 38 off-street guest parking spots, and in the winter, we lose about a third of those spaces to the storage of plowed snow. Ivory's interior units have no location to pile the snow 
that will be plowed from their private road and 14 driveways. Parcel A, bounded by sidewalks with raised curbs, is not designed to facilitate the storage of snow. Where will Ivory's residents pile snow? Capitol Park Avenue is a private road, and Ivory residents have no right to push their snow onto that road. Will they do it anyway? There is no plan for snow storage. Ivory's road is 26 feet wide, and the bare minimum to meet the code, pushing snow to one side of the road and parking on the other, will not allow emergency or other large vehicles to pass. North Point's 38 guest parking spots for 48 households are often not enough. Maintenance trucks, vendors, deliveries, and such, um, they just require guest parking. Ivory has provided only eight guest parking spots for 28 households. This is completely inadequate. One Super Bowl party and it will be overflowing. Will guests park illegally on Capitol Park Avenue? even though it is posted as no parking. Ivory has not provided space within their development to cover these basic needs. This oversight will lead to encroachment on neighboring properties and inevitable friction. This request for rezone should be denied. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Clavern. Okay, Al Hayes, you're up. Cynthia Connor, you're on deck. Jan McKinnon. You're in the hole. Uh-oh. Hearing aids tangled. That's all right. Just a sec. Good evening, my name is Alan Hayes. The staff report highlights areas where FR3 and SR1A zone houses are in adjacent blocks and conclude that they coexist in harmony as an argument for how Ivory's development will be compatible with its neighboring blocks. But the reason they look okay together is because the smaller sized SR1A lots have smaller sized homes while the larger FR3 lots have the larger homes. There is a balance of scale and proportion that creates that harmony. When Ivory cramps FR3-sized homes onto smaller SR1-sized lots, that balance and harmony of scale is lost, and the compatibility is lost with it. The closest example cited in the staff report of harmony cited by of this uh, uh, cited by the Planning Division staff report are the two blocks on 12th Avenue between D and F Streets, where the northern side is FR1 and the southern side is FR3. That's, excuse me, SR1A. Looking more closely at the 11 homes in this SR1A zone fronting 12th Avenue, we see every home is a single story where the above grade square foot averages 1,300 square feet and the setback to the road averages 42 feet. Let's compare that with Ivory's multi-gen units that make up the bulk of their ADU houses. These homes are all two-story homes. Above grade square footage with garages is almost 4,000 square feet, three times the average size of the existing SR1A homes on this example two blocks. Ivory's front setbacks are a mere 10 feet compared to 42 feet. What Ivory proposes to build is dramatically different than these two blocks. Large homes on small lots all squeezed together. This does not preserve the, preserve the existing character of the neighborhood, which is a stated goal of SR1 zone. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Mr. Hayes. Cynthia Connor, you're up. Jan McKinnon, you're on deck. Nigel Swaby, Swaby. Swaby is in the hole. Hello, my name is Cynthia Connor. Before you vote on your recommendation to the City Council, please bear in mind that approval of the rezone will create a development that looks nothing like the avenues, a development that is completely out of character with the avenues. In the FR3 zone, we will see larger homes on larger lots, setbacks are rarely cut to the minimum, plus throughout the avenues, 
city-owned land adds to the distance of the homes to the road. In the SR zone, we see predominantly older, smaller, single-story homes. Here again, homes are not built with bare minimum setbacks and are substantially city-owned land adds to the setback of the homes from the road. All of the above gives the avenues an open, pleasant scale and intensity of green appearance that adds to the quality of life and sense of well-being for all residents. Ivory houses are completely different from those typical in the SR zone. They are large, tall, two-story, four to five bedroom homes with three car garages. Individually, they might fit in the SR zone, which does have a mix of housing, but they do not fit en masse. Ivory is asking for a rezone to build an entire block of these large homes. They propose cutting every setback to the minimum or less if planned development is granted. There are no blocks in the SR zone that look anything like this. It has a density, scale, and bulk totally out of character with the SR zone. In fact, the proposed development is contrary to the very purpose statement of the SR zone. If Ivory wishes to build such large primary dwelling, each with an ADU, then they can do so under the current That's time. FR3 zoning. Thank you. Thank you, you Ms. Connor. Jan McKinnon, you're up. Nigel Swaby, you said? Swaby, you're on deck. And Maureen Bodelman is in the hole. My name is Jan McKinnon, my husband and I live in the Meridian and I serve as the HOA president. To my neighbors and friends in the overflow and to my friends and neighbors here, thank you for attending tonight's meeting. Planning Commission, we have heard many compelling reasons against the rezone, but we have yet to hear anything from Ivory that warrants a change in the zone. I ask that you consider the location of this lot, a location surrounded predominantly by FR3 zone development, a location at the upper edge of the city in a wildlife buffer zone, a location designated by the U.S. Fire Administration as a high risk from wildfire, a location that lacks any of the infrastructure required to support density. I also ask that you consider the opinions of Avenue residents. Most of us fully support the city's initiatives to increase housing stock but it cannot be done with increased density at any cost. Ivory goes too far. This plan is unreasonable. There is a point at which you have to say no, and Ivory is way past that point. A rezone to double the number of lots, a planned development to shrink setbacks on every lot, an ADU on every lot, and a plat plan that adds large two-story houses to every shrunken lot. Will the aggressive overreach of this proposal, if approved, damage the trust that residents have placed in our local government? Will the crisis of the moment blind the city to the need for well-considered, reasonable residential development decisions respectful of neighborhood context? It's time to say no. We ask the commission to give a negative recommenda recommendation to the rezone. Thank you, Ms. McKinnon. Nigel Swaby, you're up. Maureen Bodeman is on deck, and Anthony Arassi is in the hole. Good evening, Planning Commission. My name is Nigel Swaby. I was hired by Ivory uh, last year to do outreach and strategy on this project. I want to tell you about the outreach that we did. Um, first off, I read through all the Greater Avenues Community Council meeting minutes. Uh, regarding this project prior to me becoming engaged on it. Uh, we met with the Greater Avenues Executive Board uh, last March. We met, uh, we presented to the full council uh, last April. We also created a website showing updates and what the plans were for the, for the uh, property and the timeline. Uh, we created an opt-in email list which grew to 1,963 names. We sent out about 10 emails in the last year and a half, and we uh, most recent emails have had about a 20% open rate, so uh, they were very engaged. Uh, last fall, we held it, an open house on site at the property. There were about 75 people that came, including people that wanted to buy the, the product. Uh, 
Um, the second point that I want to make is that Salt Lake City is densifying. We have run out of land and infill opportunities are very few. Uh, land and house prices are at all time highs, so are rents. Uh, cost of build have increased for materials and labor. And like I said, available land is scarce. It makes sense to allow incremental density for infill projects. This is a make sense project. This is not out of character th to the neighborhood. We've, w the one word that I would describe this neighborhood is eclectic. There's all kinds of housing types there, including the ones that you've seen. I urge you to vote in a positive recommendation for this. Thank you. Thank you, Nigel. Um, Maureen Bodeman, you're up. Anthony Ariassi, you're on deck. Michael. Valentine? Valentine, maybe? Um, <laughs> you're in the hole. Thank you. Hi, my name is Maureen Bottoman, and I live a couple blocks south of the proposed site. I will lead by saying it is hard to stand up here in opposition to my neighbors in my community in support of this rezone. And I hope this truly is the safe community space it claims to be to have a discussion about this. I genuinely feel that this project contributes positively to the character of the community, acknowledging the growth Salt Lake has had and the value and privilege of being able to own a new construction home in the neighborhood of the avenues. I've heard a lot of talk of preserving the master plan. The Avenue's master plan was written before I, a homeowner in the community, was born. Using that as an immutable standard feels deliberately exclusionary to a non-trivial percentage of the community. When I've talked to my neighbors, peers, and coworkers about this project, the dominant narrative has been, that sounds awesome to have ADUs in a higher density community within the Avenues and have those people be able to be part of that. That being said, I agree with all of the points that million dollar homes is not ideal to provide more access. It feels like getting to smaller lot sizes will make it viable to have more affordable homes here. And I, since this is about the zoning and not the plan, I would love to see when we discuss the plan, a proposal for affordable homes in our community. That being said, the community's commentary on the density in yards um, and needing to have lower density and lower yards makes it feel like this is not a group that would be open to an affordable plan. Creating a safe space, uh, creating clean, safe, potential rental units through ADUs feels like the next best thing to affordable housing in our community. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bodeman. Okay, Anthony Ariassi, you're up. Michael Valentine. You're on deck. Ruth Ann Hamilton, you're in the hole. Good evening. My name is Anthony Arossi, and I'm a six-year resident of the St. Mary's neighborhood. My family owns a property in the Elkcrest neighborhood that we have been working on developing a small, simple home on, but have faced substantiated feedback from the surrounding neighbors. Opposition, like we have heard tonight, hits all areas of the city, not just the avenues. The reality is our population is increasing whether we like it or not. Therefore, I think it's necessary to steer away from outdated and restrictive regulation, zoning regulations that inhibit growth and diversity in our neighborhoods and welcome a common sense housing policy that focuses on a positive long-term outcome. It's already been mentioned, pointed out tonight that our city is facing a major housing shortage problem, so I think we should be focused on how we can increase modest uh, and affordable housing throughout the city so young people who were raised in the, in the city can live near their parents and where they might want to send their kids to school. Um, and not have to leave the city and move out to communities such as Harriman. The NIMBY mindset simply cannot, can no longer exist when people can no longer afford homes. I fully support the rezone and the request. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rossi. Michael Valentine, you're up. Ruth Ann Hamilton, you're on deck. Maria Mastakis is in the hole. Hi, how's it going? Um, my name is Michael Valentine. I'm one of the founders of Save the Pantages. I've been fighting the city for the last three years to save the theater that was just recently illegally destroyed. I'm also one of the directors of a new nonprofit, Restorative Society of Utah, that's a proponent of historic um, 
property saw throughout Utah. I'm here to support the avenues, greater community council, and also the reason um, against the zoning, against this deal, and to really kill this thing once and for all. Um, why is this the fourth time this has, has gone up here? And um, the reason is because of illegal campaign donations. In uh, January of this year, Mayor Mendenhall took donations from Clark Ivory and Christine Ivory. And then uh, before that, in uh, November, uh, she, she took donations from Boyer uh, Company. And uh, I, don't know, I guess Andrew's not here tonight because she has a conflict of interest, but she sits in the chair of Ivory and Boyer um, up at, on, um, at, the, at the University of Utah under the Eccles School of Business, the same spot where Clark Ivory has a, has a seat. So this, this deal is illegitimate. You guys are ignoring the entire community over and over. It's the same thing with the Pantages. This thing needs to end now. You need to stop supporting developers, start you know, supporting the community and listen to what's going on. You know, if you just keep railroading this through, there's going to be ramifications. I filed official complaints today with the city. I will escalate these complaints to the state of Utah, wherever they need to go. This needs to end now. You guys all work for the people of this city and not developers. Mayor Mendenhall needs to not be taking thousands and thousands of dollars of donations. And this is going to be one of the biggest campaign issues next year. As far as I know, I'm the only one running against her. And I'm running as anti-corruption candidate. And this needs to end right now. Support these people. Support the avenues. I'm tired of people like... Um, victimizing and, and, and de decrying what they're saying. They know what they're talking about. They've lived in the avenues for decades. They know what the problems with this deal is, and they've gone over it over and over tonight in amazing ways. Kill this deal now, listen to people, and uh, stop supporting corruption. Uh, you need to, yeah, that's fine. Uh, Ruth Ann Hamilton, you're up. Maria Mestakis is on deck, and Lynn Keene is in the hole. Hi, I uh, moved here about 20 years ago from New York and New Jersey, and I love the character of the avenues. It's unique, it's very diverse. Um, the people that live there, it ranges, and the, uh, that's from conservative to liberal to everything that you can find and at least where I live we all love the avenues and we all uh, support each other and what I hate to see is something that I think is the jewel in Salt Lake I'm not I didn't grow up in Salt Lake but I see the avenues as a jewel of Salt Lake City and I really would hope that the Planning Commission can see some of these jewels in Salt Lake City and not destroy them don't make a diamond into a, into a lump of coal by approving this development. One of the, I live on 12th Avenue, by the way, just on Capitol Park development. And um, the, the, lots of things have been covered, but one of the things that also concerns me is all the parking. Um, sometimes I hear that uh, Ivory Homes compares their development to other dense developments that are in the avenues like the Meridian and North Point, but there's plenty of uh, guest parking um, on the day-to-day -day, uh, living, and you don't see cars flowing out and parking on the streets. And what was pointed out on F Street, the dead ends into North Point, uh, cars, uh, these ADUs, I know that, I, I think it's illegal to have ADUs in the avenues, but they're there. And if these are used, I mean, yeah, if these are not ADUs, but I mean um, Airbnbs, and these are going to be used as Airbnbs. And where are the, all the cars going to park? As was pointed out, there's just a couple of guests parking, very narrow streets. The cars are going to be parking out on the streets. They're going to be parking, at, parking out on F Street. They're going to be parking out on our private road that we have to maintain. That's time, Ms. Hamilton. And so I'm asking you, you, and the, the fire and the children Thank and you, all Ms. the parking Hamilton. on the outside, I'm asking you, Thank you. to reject this Thank development. You, that's time. I mean, this rezone. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Maria Mastakis, you're up. Lynn Keene, you're on deck. Joel Vittori is um, in the hole. All right. Thank you, everybody, for your time. Good evening. My name is Maria Mastakis. I am a member of the board of the POAZC and the president of the Capitol Park HOA, a development with 50 homes. 
Capitol Park residents are strongly opposed to Ivory's overly dense and poorly designed development. I moved into Capitol Park in 1998 in one of the first houses on Caring Cove, which abuts the Ivory property. I now live on 11th Avenue. Over the last 23 years, I've watched houses being built in our community, all following the current zoning requirements, which has led to a beautiful family-oriented community without so much traffic that you have to worry about your kids playing on the sidewalks. Now Ivory wishes to change all this. Their application for a rezone to go from 11 lots to 19 lots in conjunction with adding 14 ADUs is completely unreasonable and has stimulated an unprecedented level of opposition from the Avenue's residents. The planning division reports they have received a staggering 654 letters with the 637 or 97% of the people being opposed. The president of Capitol Park, North Point, and the Meridian, together with the residents of F Street, representing the community that lives closest to the development, have all written in strong opposition. 2,100 Avenue's residents have signed a petition opposing rezone. The GACC has conducted two ballots on the rezone. The first ballot was 688 opposed to four in favor. The second ballot was 1,244 opposed, 98% opposition. This prolonged and increasing level of community opposition is not an expression of nimbyism, but reflects an increasing understanding of our community of how problematic and unreasonable Ivory's proposed development is. We respectfully request the Planning Commission recognize the wishes of those that are most impacted by this development and recommend against the rezone. Ivory can build homes with ADUs without a rezone. Thanks. Thank you very much. Okay, Lynn Keen, you're up. Joel. My name Victoria. is Lynn Keen. Give me just one second. Joel Victoria, you're on deck. And Leela Brown, you're in the hole. Now, go ahead. My name is Lynn Keen. My husband and I purchased our home in the Capitol Park subdivision in 2001. That decision was intimidating. Capitol Park was in its infancy and its developers appeared to be in financial trouble. The VA hospital was a derelict building looming over Capitol Park and our future home. It was a serious threat to the future of the subdivision. So before closing the purchase, we consulted the Salt Lake City Planning Division. Its director, Larry Butcher, assured us that the hospital property would be developed into a high quality condominium or demolished and developed in accordance with the FR3 zoning single family zoning standards. We relied upon his assurances and completed the purchase of our home. Until now, the city has kept the promises it gave us. It has taken over 20 years with the Capitol Park area, has successfully overcome the repeated challenges it has encountered since 2001. Only a 3.2 acre remain. Now, Ivory has appeared a proposing to develop 14 residences with 14 internal ADUs and five custom homes which may also contain ADUs. It is admitted that it would be easy to develop the site in compliance with the FR3 zoning. But Ivory seeks rezoning to nearly double the number of lots on the site and its profits. The Planning Commission has issued a report to you recommending approval of the rezoning request. If that recommendation is accepted by the Planning Commission and ultimately by the City Council, the trust that we and other residents have placed in the City's fidelity to its own laws will be broken. That's not right. Thank you, Ms. King. Joel Dicatori, you're up. Huh? Deaton. Deaton. Yes. Oh. That's, that's not what it looked like. <laughs> Are um, you a doctor? <laughs> uh, Leela Brown, you're on deck, and Charlie Cannon is in the hole. Good evening. I'm Joel Deaton, and I'm president of the North Point Homeowners Association. We have 50 homes there, and the North Point residents are strongly opposed to this proposal. Should Ivory Homes get a rezone or not? This is a question being asked by the Planning Commission this evening, and we are curious about what factors come into play in making the decision. One, here are eight factors to consider. The first factor is fit with the FR3 and SR1 purpose statement. A review of the purpose statements for the FR3 and the SR zone ordinance shows a far closer fit with FR3, 
which is designed for such foothill locations. Zoning of adjacent and nearby development, number two. The vast majority of adjacent and nearby developments are zoned FR3. Three, topography. It is difficult to build on sloped lots, even more difficult to build well with density. We see this uh, density as a mess that Ivory has in their design. Four, size and type of housing. Unquestionably, the housing Ivory wishes to build are far more typical of those in the FR3 zone than those in the SR zone. Five, community opinion. I think this goes without saying. You've heard a lot of opposition to this from the community. Six, the environment. In every regard, FR3 is the more appropriate zoning classification due to wildfire risk, protection of wildlife habitat, air quality, drainage, erosion, and retention of mature trees and the traffic issues. Walkability number seven. City policy calls for density to be added to walkable neighborhoods uh, close to mass transit, jobs, and amenities. This is not such a location. And eight, compatibility and preservation of neighborhood character. Ivory's proposed development is not compatible with current housing That's bulk time, and density. Please do not approve this. That's Thank time. you. Thank you. Leela Brown, you're up. Charlie Cannon, you're on deck. And Aaron Beck, you're in the hole. Good evening. I am Leela Brown. Ivory refers to the 14 units with ADUs as quote unquote cottages. These are not cottages, but large, tall, two story, four or five bedroom homes with three car garages. The city defines cottages as quote, small single family homes, end quote. The form based zone defines cottages as having a footprint of not greater than 850 square feet. Ivory's multi-gen units, which make up 11 of the 14 units with ADUs, have a footprint of around 2,100 square feet, two and a half times the city definition of a cottage. Plus, <clears throat> of course, these are all two-story quote-unquote cottages. So let us dispel all illusions that Ivory's buildings are quaint country cottages. Ivory's buildings are large houses, far more typical of those found in the FR3 zoned Capitol Park area than those in the SR-1A zone of the avenues, where most homes are small, single-story dwellings. Ivory uses a rezone to roughly double the number of lots going from a maximum of 11 under FR3 to 19. Ivory then misuses the plan development ordinance to reduce setbacks everywhere, including on the periphery to gain more lots that would be possible under strict compliance with the requested zone. And then Ivory wants to build these large two-story homes complete with three car garages, not cottages, onto these shrunken lots with reduced setbacks. The result, everyone, is a high That's bulk, time. high density development Thank that you, is Ms. not compatible with That's existing time. neighborhood Thank and does you. not maintain our character. Thank you. That's time. Thank you very much for your time. Charlie Cannon, you're up and Aaron Beck is on deck. And that's the end of the cards. Oh, well, who wishes to speak? Okay, please go ahead. Cannon, I live at uh, 536 East 13th Avenue. Uh, I carefully reviewed the staff report, the report that's, that sits before you for action tonight. Um, I find it's dismissive of most of the concerns that have been raised by my friends and neighbors who've addressed you this evening. I would suggest to you that you carefully weigh the many issues that have been raised, that you reserve the right to further review and understand what's happening here and not recommend, forward the recommendations of the staff to the city. Uh, 
and that's my request. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Cannon. Aaron Beck, you're up. Good evening, I'm Aaron Beck. I'm a realtor and I've lived at the avenues for 20 years. Uh, when the city designed the public street system for the avenues, it wisely granted a wide right of way for all the roads that serve this community. The roads do not consume all of this right of way, such that there's typically 20 to 30 feet of city owned land on each side of the upper avenue streets. This city owned land is not maintained by the city and in most instances has been integrated into the landscaping of individual properties. The presence of this substantial amount of city owned land helps give the avenues an open, green, leafy, pleasant appeal, despite having relatively small 5,000 square feet lot sizes in the SR1A zone. Ivory's development lacks the city owned land, such that the visual impact of reducing lot sizes via a rezone and setbacks via a planned development is greatly magnified. Private developments in the upper avenues, such as Capitol Park, also lack this city owned land but compensate by having larger lot sizes. Standard density measurements do not take into account the city owned land, which would typically give an additional 1,000 to 1,500 square feet of front setback to the road, adding to the comparative density of Ivory's development in relation to the existing SR1A zone. The impact of city owned land is significant and should be taken into account in considering a radical change from FR3 to SR1 zoning significantly reduces reducing lot sizes where there is no compensating city land to buffer density. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Beck. Okay, we have no more cards that were given for people who wish to speak that are here in person. I do have four cards of people who um, will have comments I'll read into the record because they did not wish to speak. Um, so the first is Erica Farr. Um, the proposed rezoning for lot 675 North would be too high density for the access and services currently available in the upper avenues. The increased density in current plans submitted by Ivory Homes is incongruous with character and historic nature of the av avenues, which previous precedents has protected with zoning rules. The next one is Ben Farr. Uh, the infrastructure of the neighborhood cannot support the proposed zoning amendment as members of the community we have already voted in overwhelming opposition against any rezoning. Please stop dragging this out and wasting our time. You are our elected officials, not Ivory's. Kathy Tenney, this will cause too much traffic and pollution and endanger folks walking on the roads. And finally, Susan McNamara, the issue isn't what's best for Ivory, it is what is best for the avenues in Salt Lake City as a whole. Ivory will build and make a profit no matter what. Give the needs to Salt Lake City and Avenue, the plan proposed is seriously flawed. The many factors addressing this issue have been well laid out by others. Please deny the rezone and negotiate a plan that fits us, not Ivory. Okay, that concludes the comments for in person. We're going to move to um, the WebEx portion of our hybrid meeting. And uh, Amy, I believe you're going to be running that. So if you want to, if you are in attendance via WebEx, you'll need to raise your hand in order to be recognized to speak, and the same rules will apply. You'll have up to two minutes um, after you state your name. And Amy, I'll have you actually monitor that time. Just if you are listening and you want to speak, there is a little hand down on the right hand of the screen and it's kind of hard to find. So um, we can give you guys a few minutes to look for that. Um, without the hand up, there's any way for anybody who's online to indicate that we'd like you to speak. So we can give you a few minutes and if you want, um, and I'm sure I could read the emails we got while we're waiting to see if people want to raise their Absolutely, hand. Absolutely, that sounds okay. great. I will time those. Those will, I'll cut you off if you go over two minutes for those as well. Okay, thank you. For fairness. Um, the first email is from Genevieve Batwood. We can frame this issue several ways, but it seems clear to me when we work diligently together and create a master plan, are we just kidding? Or is the city just kidding when it requests it as an input? If we want to protect foothills and we have a master plan that does that, don't approve a development that undermines the master plan's foundation and pulls the rug out from citizens' extensive time and effort. It's a major loss of credibility. Thank you, I'm not sure. This is how I present my view from everything I hear the city has tried to respect all of you. Thank you, my view is to stay the course with the master plan. Okay, yes, sorry, sorry. And I was the one who told people to do that same thing, so. Mm -hmm. 
Um, the next one is from Casey O'Brien McDonough. Dear Planning Commissioners, I do not believe Ivory had made a genuine effort to meet the concerns of the neighborhood and neighborhood councils. A compromise is something near the middle or two positions. The property was zoned the way it was for a reason. Many, many hours of public input and decades of planning. The large majority of the neighborhood and the neighborhood councils don't want this zoning and master plan change. If the developer really wanted to compromise and find middle ground, they would not be proposing these changes in the density that they are. My impression is that the neighborhood and neighborhood council have always been willing to meet the developer in the middle, but the developer has clearly not been willing as the current proposal is far from being welcomed by neighborhood and neighborhood councils. I keep hearing comments about affordability and that somehow this development will do something in that effort. The development will, of course, not be anything close to affordable. It's a false promise and I believe a disingenuous effort to make this zoning and master plan change sound good. It is, in effect, a bait and switch. We keep hearing the rally cry of more housing and more density will solve the housing opportunity affordability crisis. But if that were the case, places like New York would have the most opportunity and be the most affordable. And it, of course, neither of those. For those reasons and all our public comments made in the past and tonight against this project, I would like you to give a negative recommendation to the City Council for this proposal. I would also add that I strongly encourage any of you who have a conflict of interest with the applicant in any way, shape, or form to abstain from voting on this matter. To not do so gives the impression of undue influence and puts public trust in the Planning Commission at too great a risk. I do not believe you're in the position that you are to represent the interest of developers. You are in your position to represent the residents of the city, most important, the interests and desires of the neighborhood and the neighborhood councils who will be most affected by this proposed project. And um, we did receive some emails from people who also spoke, and so we're not going to read those into the record, but they will be put into the record as well. Okay, that concludes the emails. I th we're almost there, sorry. Um, okay. The next one's from Andrew Steiner. Uh, he says, hello, I know it's late notice, but I'd be interested in participating in tonight's media. Um, I did send in the link, but he said we'd be okay just to read this email. Um, it's also probably past judgment, but I feel much better if Ivory were pursuing SR1A instead of SR1 because this would be consistent with the plots adjacent to the east if they're essentially FR3 and actual build out. The height, added height of FRs, FR1 seems to present concerns towards changing the character of the buildings. Five additional feet can be a big difference. My largest current th concern, though, remains um, the att attribution of a strong opposition to me as a resident of F Street by the Protector Avenues group and the half hearted response that I don't live on F Street because as a corner house, my address was arbitrarily assigned to one of the two available alternatives. I believe this is the last one that we received during the meetings from Diane Thompson. I love the idea of having some new home choices in this area. Having my mom live with me could have been a blessing this year when she was struggling. Or being able to have a college-age child live adjacent to my primary residence would be lovely. I'm really hoping this development was forward for a number of reasons. And again, that was Diane Thompson. That's all the emails that we've received since uh, 4.45 okay. today. No hands are raised via WebEx. We do not have any hands raised. I'm wondering if I should just go through and um, right now there's only eight people on the WebEx and just double check that they don't want to speak. Fair um, enough. Okay. So uh, Darcy Taylor, I'm going to unmute you if you'd like to speak. Darcy Taylor, you're unmuted. Thank you, Ms. Taylor. Okay, next up is Frank, um, Frank Langheinrich. Uh, you will be unmuted if you want to speak. Frank Langheinrich. So I'm thinking now. Yes. yes, we can hear you.
Thank you. Would you state your name for the record? Thank you. Okay, next up is Nathan Peters. Nathan Peters, I'm unmuting you. You are unmuted, and you have two minutes. Thank you. Would you just state your name for the record? Thank you so much. All right. Uh, next on the list is Johannes Polo. I'm unmuting you. If you wish to speak, please let us know. Johannes Polo. And sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name. Okay. Going um, to the next one, Shane. Shane, you're unmuted if you wish to speak. Shane? Okay. Did you hear someone on the previous one? Okay. And last one on the list is Tony Semerad. <laughs> Tony, if you'd like to speak, you're unmuted. Thanks. I think he said he's, he wasn't interested in speaking. OK. With that, we will close the public comment period. Um, I want to thank everyone, um, including um, ev just everyone in the room, for participating. I just want to take a couple moments to talk about what will happen next um, and also give you kind of a brief understanding. So you know, the Planning Commission, we are all members of the community and we volunteer our time as planning commissioners um, so we're not we're not paid employees we're we're here to evaluate these projects but we don't have the flexibility that the city council does as elected officials so i will just remind the planning commissioners when we do evaluate this particular um, request for a zoning map amendment and a master plan amendment we need to um, look at the legal standards that direct um, that are our guidelines and they're on page 81 of the staff report. So as you evaluate the project with everything you've heard tonight, we, we have to tie it back to those standards, um, which is just our legal restrictions as planning commissioners. Now I'm going to give the applicant time, but not like unlimited, right? <laughs> so I don't want to necessarily sure? cut you off, but I want you to be able to address some of the major points that, that were brought up and give you um, that opportunity as per our rules. And then I'll bring it to the commission and we'll have a discussion and that may include some additional questions for you and our staff. Thank you. Go ahead. Madam Chair, members of the Planning Commission, my name is Chris Gamvaroulis. I'm uh, the president of Ivory Development. I'm also a Salt Lake City resident. I live in the Sugar House area and I served on the RAC, on the Redevelopment Advisory Committee for eight years and as the chair of the RAC as well. Uh, so lifelong Salt Lake City resident. Um, and uh, have developed in different parts of the city. Um, and uh, when this property became available uh, from the uh, 
uh, Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Uh, there were there was quite a bit of interest in it um, locally and, and actually in the neighborhood. Um, there, they, there was a for sale sign on the corner um, and they did receive a lot of offers on it. Um, this just, I'm gonna try and, I'm gonna do my best to try and stay focused on the land use even though we had a lot of public comment that wasn't really, really focused on the land use. So I'm gonna yeah, do my I, best I to stay on that. Do you think it's, you don't need to go into any comments about the plan development right. because that's not what's before us tonight. Um, so we can't consider those and right. just keep so it a little I won't, more topical. Yeah. Three yeah. car garages, those kind of things. I'm gonna, we'll, we'll, we'll push those off uh, perhaps to another day. Um, but to stay on, on some of the land use and some of the arguments against the change in the land use and uh, at a macro level like the traffic um, and this, in, you know, this uh, increase in traffic in this area. We did, um, we did commission a traffic study. Um, your own traffic engineer said, we probably don't need one, this is pretty small, but let's go ahead and get one anyway. We gave it and the traffic engineer said, yep, that's what we thought was gonna happen. Um, and, uh, and really what it said was that at peak PM hours, which were the highest, you know, peak PM was higher than peak AM, so they used the peak PM. We were talking about 30 some odd cars between four and six. So in, it, it, so in those peak PM hours with this project, um, in addition to the 20 cars that they counted, so in a 120 minute period, it would have uh, an impact of 34, um, uh, uh, th 34 trips. Um, so one, the underlying traffic is not significant. Um, and, and two, this increase, this density increase, this redone does not significantly increase the traffic. Um, again, just trying to stay focused on the land use. Um, a lot of things, you know, were said about the fire um, and, and those kinds of things and fire safety. And from a land use standpoint, I would simply argue that whether there's nine homes or 11 homes or 20 homes, that if there is fire danger, there's fire danger. And if there's not, then there's not. I'm not saying that there's not, but it doesn't change the fire danger if there are bigger homes on bigger lots. Um, it just means that they're more expensive homes on bigger lots. Um, so the, the kinds of arguments, infrastructure uh, arguments, I, I just, uh, I, I have a real challenge with those uh, as we talk about the, the land use. Um, something was brought up relative to the land use was, the, was Capitol Park Avenue and its ability to service this area. It's been determined by the engineering department that it is. Uh, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints negotiated an easement about 20 years ago with Wally Wright, and there is access on Capitol Park Avenue that, uh, uh, that does provide access to this property. So we, we, uh, we want you to know that. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the, director, the previous director of UCARE wrote a letter um, in support of this um, to the issue of land use and increased density relative to uh, air quality and some of the, the arguments that you heard. Um, Tom Carter, who was the previous director of UCARE said, no, actually this increasing the density here is actually better um, than moving people to Harriman. We're happy that people want to move up to Harriman because we're also happy we're, we build a lot of homes there, but we all share a same air shed. So I don't want you to be, to think that the avenues has a different air shed than Sugar House or Harriman. The air shed is the same, so it, it's irrespective of where the density is. Um, I think Peter, uh, and we are related, by the way. I don't know if you caught that. Um, we share a last name. He is not my brother. Um, he looks like it, um, but uh, I thought he did an, uh, an excellent job of being focused on the land use. Um, this property is surrounded by a diverse housing stock. This is not FR3 surrounded by FR3. It simply isn't. Um, and, uh, you know, you can't be across the street from a five-story condo building and next to 50 townhomes and have some small lot single family across from you and share one, you know, the west boundary with large lots and say that the only thing in this area are large single family lots. They're not. Um, Peter put up on the screen earlier, um, not for debate now, but, but to three different site plans, and that was an evolution. Um, from 
2020, 2021, and going to the GAC meetings. I can tell you we went, we listened, we responded, we came back with other plans, we came back with other plans, and the answer was always only FR3. We can only accept multi-million dollar homes on large lots. That's all we can accept. And so it didn't matter whether, we, whether there were 34 or 25 or 19. Um, and so at some point we did make the decision that we would come in and ask for the rezone and then come back with a site plan. Our site plan, I can tell you, it's not perfect. It's not, it's, um, that's why we're here. Um, that's why we work with your staff uh, to improve it, uh, to make it better. Uh, so there, there are a lot of knocks on the current, current site plan and there are a lot of them are very valid um, because we haven't figured everything out yet. Um, but we can't get there until we have the rezone. And we are really committed to doing more affordability and, and, and trying to do the ADUs. And if this was purely an affordability play, we would be in here with a lot more units. And if we will get this kind of opposition to going from very low density to low density, imagine what it would be if we came in with a bunch of condos. It would just, it would, it wouldn't be, a, and, and this is, um, you know, this, this level of, of opposition would just be amplified. We're not trying to upset the whole community. We do think that, that very low density to low density is a very moderate increase, and it is certainly justified here, where it is surrounded by a, a mix of uses. Um, so thank you. Um, that's all. Okay, thank you. All right, now we're going to enter into the discussion portion of our meeting in this decision. Um, so, commissioners, if you have comments, um, now is the time to talk this out. I like this. You have no thoughts whatsoever. Yeah. I'll say something. Okay. There's, um, I feel like the uh, comments tonight have been very, they've been a compliment to your neighborhood. You all are, that you seem like you understand this project, you've read the reports, you um, are concerned for the neighbors that you have right now and the neighbors that you will have, because you understand this is an empty lot right now. Um, but it, in, in all of these public hearings, it's interesting because people love their neighborhoods just like I do. I love my neighborhood and I love my neighbors. Um, and I don't necessarily want it to change. And my neighborhood is perfect except unless somebody wanted to do something different in my neighborhood, in which case it's the worst neighborhood ever. It has terrible roads and fire engines can't get to it and <laughs> ambulances won't get there on time and the alleys are too narrow and all of that kind of stuff. So that's, that's kind of stuff that I expect to hear and I did hear. Um, and do your voices count? It's kind of amazing how it's not amazing. I'm not, actually not surprised that, that you are so organized and your comments are thoughtful and they seem to speak to what the rules are. Um, so I, I've been impressed with that. I think it's a good neighborhood and I think that whoever and how many families uh, move on to this lot, they'll be lucky to have you as neighbors. Um, I think, I think a couple of the, the things that are kind of um, moving to me, um, and you may have all had a chance to read the staff report. Lots of times people come in to make comments and they haven't read the staff report, so it's not clear to people what, what we are making a decision on. Um, but as Chairperson Barry pointed out, there are like f kind of five considerations that we make to say, um, to say, how, how would we vote on this? Does this follow the rules? And the, you know, the planning department, these guys are the experts, they're schooled in this, they've looked at a lot of these projects, um, thought about this project a lot, listened to everything that you guys have to say, and their findings are in that staff report. And for a lot of, and, and I'm, I'm, we usually are pretty moved by that, um, because of the work that's gone into it and the expertise that's behind it. Um, a couple of the 
questions, maybe the one to me that's the most kind of questionable is that first one where it says, does this plan, whether a proposed map amendment is consistent with the purposes, goals, objectives, and policies of the city as stated through its various adopted planning documents. Um, the future land use map, which we've talked about a lot, was, was from 35 years ago, 1987. There's some question about does this, does this land use match that one? Um, because it says that any, any kind of density is not desirable. <laughs> that was one of the quotes out of that, out of that map. And I, I just feel like maybe that the city plans, the, one of the other various adopted planning documents, the two of them um, that are a little bit in conflict with that, um, are newer and maybe things that we decided were not desirable in 1987 um, are probably more desirable now based on those two new um, documents. I wonder if this is density in the wrong place um, because we every time we see a project that's like on the tracks line we're like why don't you build more? Why don't you put more units in there? Why don't you build bigger ones so that families can live there and they don't have to drive? Um, and this isn't on the tracks line, so there's, that's a little bit of a question to me. Is this in the wrong place? Um, but I think, I think it is a good neighborhood that does have, you know, the reports say that there's infrastructure for it and the traffic is, um, it's a huge concern for people who live on that street, but it's, um, overall, the traffic report says it's not. Um, Considering the um, afford affordable housing overlay, which I know it's not called that anymore, but I'm still calling it that, where you make, um, there was some incentive to give developers some kind of like looser rules um, if they built affordable units. I, that's not in consideration here, but I also want us to think that we don't want to be too loose because then what will the incentive be? Because the, um, if you're not, then you could just get any change you want without doing the affordable housing. So I'm also kind of thinking about that. Um, I appreciate the comments and the time today. And I, I listen to you. But I, I'm also looking at what decisions we make. We're not a discretionary body. I don't think like the actual politicians who are elected to represent you are. Um, we come from all over the city and we care about it and we also see it in a in a big picture kind of way so that's it for me thank you Amy. andreas well i guess just some thoughts and i also agree uh with the fact that it's uh you know a unique part of the city and maybe the density is in the in the wrong place um the one um i'm looking at number three the extent to which this proposed amendment will affect adjacent properties, to me, that is yet to be reconciled uh, as I look at this proposed amendment, um, because I feel that it does affect adversely um, to the um, neighborhood. Um, so I'm still trying to grapple that with, um, with what's been proposed. Um, the uh, you know looking looking at the project itself, I'm sure the neighbors here as well. You know everybody wants to have a nice um, uh, community. Everybody wants to have a nice um, neighborhood, and uh, I wonder if Ivory can do in the F um, three zone is it F three um, what it needs to do for its purposes uh, FR three zone rather than having to do an, amend, an amendment to the already existing um, zoning. So those are just my thoughts. Okay. I just wanted to make a statement too about the ADUs. Um, just because they would be built as an ADU, um, oh, normally I don't have that problem. Is that better? Is my mic not working? <laughs> okay, <laughs> speak up. I, um, I, I, I think just because an ADU is built doesn't mean that it will operate as an ADU. If it doesn't meet the requirements of having an owner-occupied 
um, you know, one of one of those structures and then go through the process of, of renting it or, or using it as an ADU. So we may build something that could be an ADU, but the owner, homeowner, eventually may decide not to use it that way. And so we should be calculating, like, the potential of how many people the, this could house, but realistically, not every homeowner will engage in wanting it to be an ADU at the time. So um, I'm also trying to think that through of like what kind of impact that actually makes. I, I do think you have to um, think about the potential of ADUs because you're right, unless there's a homeowner who lives in the home, if, if somebody buys a home and then rents the whole house out, they can't also rent the ADU. Correct. Under current zoning. Um, yeah, under current rules. Yeah, that's right. Um, I am. I'm impressed with the the the, uh, the neighborhood as well, and also there's, um, to me, um, been a lot of comments tonight that seem a little over the top. Um, we're talking about the potential of perhaps. 11 more units than might have otherwise been built by right. So I don't think it's fair to say that this is a disaster, that it's character destroying, that it is uh, a very high risk, that it's endangering children, that it's worsening Salt Lake Valley's air pollution, or that it's turning a diamond into a lump of coal or that it's gone way past anything that the one could even imagine, or that it was unreasonable. I also don't think it's, uh, I think there are a number of red herrings out there too that have been proposed as, as reasons why we shouldn't approve this. One is the traffic services and infrastructure, which as a certified planner, and a person who's done my own studies of traffic many times, I know that um, 11 additional units, or even 33 additional units is a drop in the bucket, especially compared to the street infrastructure, the block sizes, the number of streets, and so forth of the avenues. Um, yes, it's true that it's in a wildfire zone. I live in a wildfire zone too. I live in a zone with one way out for 400 units, not 50. Um, the fact that families won't live here. We just don't have any sense that that is true. Uh, I think families will be very happy to have the opportunity to live in a new house in the avenues, which is such a great neighborhood. Um, the fact that it's not a fit with the neighborhood. We haven't seen the design yet, so we don't really know whether it's going to be a fit with the neighborhood or not. Um, and the fact that, it's a, that the master plan doesn't go with the master plan. Things have changed a lot since that master plan was done, and I think we have to consider reasonable and um, workable adjustments, particularly if it's we're adding a very, very modest amount, number, amount of density to an already very low density neighborhood. Um, this is my own personal opinion, but I don't think a 12,000 minimum lot size should be built any more in the, in the city of Salt Lake. We should be always looking to, high, to make higher density lots in the city because we are, we are a city, we're not a suburb. I do think that there are some issues uh, that have been raised that are reasonable, such as the issue of walkability, the issue of wildlife habitat, and I would like to see how the slopes are going to be handled in, this, in any new proposal. I would not be looking to make a lot of exceptions in a conditional use uh, plan development, uh, especially since this has already been a rather controversial project. So I'm, uh, if, we, if I see something coming back in, I think that has uh, um, 19 lots, and every single one of them is an exception to the SR1. That's not going to probably uh, go down as well as a better planned and better designed uh, property with a real attention to the quality of the open space. 
and the quality of the project and the quality of the buildings themselves. So um, I would also like to point out that um, the Avenues is a wonderful place. On the other hand, it's a fairly low density place in general. Um, and we are building high density stuff pretty much all over the city. Um, so you are, um, so the things that are going up in Sugar House, for example, or Central City or Marmalade or on uh, North Temple, where we have people come in all the time who are just like you, um, but perhaps um, not as well organized, not as um, thoughtful in their responses, who have, fit, who have the emotional feel that's exactly the same about to protect their neighborhood. On the other hand, they have to live with a five-story building across the street from their single-family house. So um, it is difficult for me to see that this is unfair uh, to the avenues. That's all. Thank you, Brenda. Adrian? I agree with Brenda. I'm a resident of the avenues. I love the avenues. I live in the avenues. I agree with Brenda. I love the avenues. I love my neighborhood. I love how eclectic it is. I love the fact that on my street, a historic street that looks like a bunch of single family homes, I have a neighbor who rents out four apartments and that's her income and that's how she can stay in her house. I love that on my, my other neighbor, it's two families living in a house that looks exactly like a single family home. It just creates diversity and opportunity for people to live in this neighborhood that we don't create otherwise. So I'm a big believer in infill development. I'm a big believer that every neighborhood in the city should be finding opportunities to create density and alternative housing products. I don't think the number of units here is outrageous or will create the impacts that we heard about tonight. I drive these streets every day. I know this neighborhood. So I, again, just to reiterate what Brenda said, I'm in support of the project and I think this is a citywide imperative to come up with creative solutions to our housing crisis. Commissioners, any other discussion rights? Mike? I just wanted to echo what uh, Brenda and Adrian have just said, that uh, I do not believe that what is being asked in the application uh, is anything more than just a modest increase in the number of units, and I don't foresee anything uh, I don't, I don't see any, any adverse impacts uh, being placed upon the neighborhood by this uh, request. All right, any other commissioners? Rick? I certainly support the idea that every neighborhood has to be willing to accept greater density. It's just, it's one of the only solutions we have. I think that my concern is that we may be making this decision in the wrong order. I'd actually like to know what the plan is. The, and uh, please, everyone, please. You've been so great tonight. Please, let's and, stick to it. And, and echo the fact that I generally support what Ivory is talking about, but I just, if, if it were happening in my neighborhood, and, it, and there are some fairly high density projects in my neighborhood, I would wanna know what the final result is gonna be. Okay. Thank you, Eric. Maureen? I, I don't think your density ask is huge. I, I don't think the density ask is too significant. And I lived in the avenues for a long time. It is an eclectic neighborhood with a whole mix of different kinds of housing types. And I think it puts the burden on you guys to come back with a really, really good plan. But I'm willing to make a motion. Oh, okay. 
Based on the analysis and findings listed in the staff report, information presented, and the input received during the public hearing, I move the Planning Commission forward a positive recommendation for the zoning map and master plan amendment requests, PLN PCM 2020-00335 and PLN PCM 2020-00334 with the conditions le it listed in the staff report. I'll second that. One second, uh, one second. So we have a motion from Maureen and a second from Mike. Amy, you wanna? Microphone, please. We can't hear anything you're saying. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry guys. On the, um, on the second condition listed in the staff report where it says rear property line, maybe add the language that says rear or side yard property line. Because of that. Because of that one, that one, one that's on the, the side, okay. on the I'll, western. I'll, I'll take that as the uh, You'll accept that friendly, friendly amendment? Yeah. Okay. So we have um, a motion for Maureen, a second for Mike with the friendly amendment accepted. Any discussion to this motion? Okay then, let's go ahead and take a vote. We will start with Maureen. Yes. Adrian. Yes. Amy. Yes. Mike. Yes. John. I was a yes. John. He said yes. Oh, he did. I didn't hear. Him. Andreas. I will vote no. Brenda. Yes. Rick. Levi. Yes. Okay, and I also vote yes. That motion um, passes. I do want to state that um, I think the majority of the comments that we heard tonight, the, that we listened to, um, yeah, the burden for those are really going to be in what you bring back in terms of setbacks and all that stuff. So expect some real scrutiny from us on that. And I want to thank everyone who came to attend this meeting and remind you this is not the last opportunity for you to participate. This will be moving on to the city council who are the ultimate um, deciders on this. Um, when they uh, put it on their agenda, that will be noticed and you can um, participate again um, during that process. So thank you all again for your time and your very thoughtful comments. We do appreciate them. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Thank you both, really and we look forward to seeing something really great when you come back. All right, that concludes the business of the Planning Commission this evening. I'm going to adjourn our meeting. Thank you all.